Welcome back to Colors of a Crutch. My name is Max Sternberg, aka Wounded Satellite, and I'm joined today not only by my beautiful co-host Max P, the Italian man, hashtag Control Winter is here, but with us today is also the only man I know who starts this morning off with a glass of orange juice and Aunt Jemima's, our syrupy lord and savior. We've got Freedom Waffle with us here today. Hey, my name is Freedom Waffle. Um, I'm a tournament grinder uh, known for playing Dargo Thras, uh, and I also have a YouTube channel at Freedom Waffle, so go check that out. And yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, thanks yeah. for joining us, Freedom. Today is going to be so, today's going to be a fun one. Today's going to be a fun one. Max, you want to let us know what we're doing today? Yeah, I'll take you through it. So we've got a, one very simple task today, and that's it. We're only doing one thing, and that is we're going to take you through our personal top fifteen CDH decks. Um, so we're going to go through. We're going to each take our turn. We're going to go through all fifteen decks that we think are the best in the format. So. Um, with that, I mean, I think we should just start at the top, right? We talk about the the number one deck of the format because that's easy. We all know what the number one deck of the format is, right? Should we all? I think we should all reveal it. Time. Just just reveal yeah, the, at the same time. Choice. You want to give us okay. a countdown? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Ready? All right. No, no surprises. It, we should all know. Three, two, one. Florian. 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 Obviously, Florian. Yeah. Clearly Undeniably. Florian. Undeniably. Oh, uh, and now the jokes are aside, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's obvious. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But but the rest of our tier list today is based on decks on the database, so we'll, we'll go over those as well. <laughs> Which means we cannot have any non-blue decks, of course. Um, <laughs> do no, I have a actually, single non-blue deck? Oh, I do. Uh, do you? I have Omnix. Oh, you do? I have I have a, I have a. Oh no! Spoilers! No spoilers! Oh oh no! no Omnix <laughs> isn't in my isn't in my top fifteen. Sorry, you were talking about in the top fifteen list. Uh, 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 I have a couple. I have a couple. I have a couple. Uh, I think I have. I have. I have three. I have, I have three. Two. I, two. I, I have like two. blue. I like blue. I think blue, blue is a very powerful color in CDH. Uh, yeah, I do think it's topium. important to kind of say... You don't need it. I do think it's important to mention how we came up with our list, which I don't know exactly how you guys did yours. Mine, I've only been to the format for a little over five months now, so I'm not someone who has this large multi-year understanding of where the format has been and to where it's come to. I've only seen what I've seen. I've come in with a fresh set of eyes. So my list is a combination of tournament results, my personal fear and experience against the deck. And for some lists, I am considering them with their best pilot. I'm not rating a deck's power level generically on how easy it is to pick up or, oh, how good could an average pilot do with it? I wanna know how strong I think a deck is when it's at its best. And so that's that's kind of how I did that. And you're gonna see some of that reflected in some of my choices here. Um, should I kick it right off at number 15? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So my personal number 15, uh, the only Mardu pile I chose to include today in one of my non-blue decks is Tim to Jessica. When I'm considering Tim to Jessica, I'm considering it as what I think is the best embodiment of Mardu uh, in how I think I would play it and what I think is the most powerful way to play it. Obviously, you can go all gas, no breaks for something like the Hot Up, but I think that there are more weaknesses there, and I think Tim, Je Tim to Jessica is a better overall strategy. You get to combine turbo win cons, speed and protection of Mardu with the grind ability of Timna and the tempo removal of Jessica, which can be very, very powerful. It's a deck that gets to take advantage of card advantage, removal, and an outlet for infinite mana all in the command zone. It can win in a ton of different ways. It has very powerful win cons, though they do come with some risk. Obviously, Ad Nauseam is going to hit you for life. Citadel is going to hit you for life. You're going to get really low. And some of them are very all in with some lists running Bomberman combo or World Gorder Dragon, where you were just prone to being completely blown out and essentially removed from the game. It does fold pretty hard to stacks pieces, and its only way to properly protect itself is with silence effects. So if you don't have silence effects, you're extremely, extremely fragile and very easy to interact with. So I think the deck is strong, but I think it's got a ways to go before it gets up above 15, in my opinion. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. I, I like that choice. Uh, I have a Mardu deck in the top 15, but it is not Tim to Jessica. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I rate my decks a little bit differently than you in the sense that, you know, I'm looking for a deck that in the hands of the best pilot for that particular deck can absolutely dominate a table. Um, you know, and, you know, to that end, like I, my number 15 deck is actually uh, Tevish Rograk. And I'm talking about specifically the poly stacks. Uh, version of that deck and and you know it's not for everyone i think if you put that deck in the in the wrong hands uh it, it's very difficult to pilot you have to really keep the right mulligans and, and keep explosive starts and be able to deal with um you know everyone seeing you as the threat and it's a it's a difficult deck to navigate but when it's navigated in the hands of someone like uh peter uh or or pro that's john uh, those guys can just absolutely crush the table right from the get um, so I just think that deck is extremely powerful. Um, it's 
Coast. Also underrepresented quite a bit because it only really exists in the West Coast meta. You're just not seeing it on the East Coast very often. Um, uh, you know, probably because Peter and John live on the West Coast. Um, but I think that deck's really good. Um, so I put it at 15. Yeah, I think that's an awesome choice. Tevish Rograk is, is one I considered. It was close. It was close. That deck has done some really, really cool things. And it continues to perform. If you actually look at its sample size and conversion rate, it is like pretty strong in the tournament meta. There's just not a lot of people who play it. I know I've died yeah. to it too many times. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my number 15 is Niv Mizzet Perun. And this is... So we're talking about how we are rating these lists uh, based on our criteria. Some of these lists, there's multiple that are carried by almost one pilot alone, and Dim Visit is definitely one of those lists. Shauna has just been performing and performing over and over on this list, uh, just making uh, top 16 like every single time, uh, top four uh, definitely multiple times, and this list is definitely a house. It's got multiple one card win cons with the commander. It's in Is It, which obviously gives you access to uh, some of the, or arguably the best win con, which is Underworld Breach, and probably the best card in the format right now, Dogside Extortionist. And of course you get blue counter spells. So definitely interesting that like, this is a control archetype that still makes it. I don't think there's arguably any other control lists that made my top 16 or top 15. Um, but yeah, this list is super powerful. Uh, but of course, being only two colors, you lose access to, you know, a lot of the powerful cards like black tutors, white silences. Um, and we're not even gonna talk about green but <laughs> definitely <laughs> definitely a uh, noteworthy mention and got to shout out Shauna whenever you talk about Nymph Visit. Yeah. yeah, Shauna's yeah. incredible, incredible. That deck is, in, in her hands, is, is a force to be reckoned with. It, it really is. So I, I, I like I like Nymph there. Um, I, you know, spoiler alert, I have Nymph on the list too, a little higher up. So yeah. we'll get to that in a minute. The, the transitions pretty well into my number 14 deck, which is uh, Nymph Visit Perude because of Shauna. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I wrote on this one. I actually said it's probably the most pilot-centric include for me. I, I will say on the WinCon consideration, she doesn't run Underworld Breach. Um, which yeah. I, it's something I've always wondered. I think I, she I honestly it didn't even she realize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah she I just assumed. I just yeah, assumed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. It, it would make sense. Sorry, like, Shauna. I have disrespected yeah. your name. <laughs> I would kind of like the idea of oh, I can like I can LED into Niv and trust the card advantage. Like I think there's a world I'd want to do that. Kind of like when you LED into Tevish and Chrome Tevish or something like that. Like I, I could see that being a worthwhile include. Um, but yeah, my my notes for Niv visit honestly a very clear reflection of yours. I love that it's a deck with just so much interaction, and it's a deck that because of its commander can trust to refill with that interaction. So similar to a deck like Talion now, it can just more than happy to interact for tempo. Not everything needs to be stopping when attempts. It just needs to slow people down because it is inherently going to gain advantage from people just casting spells and doing things. I love that it has A plus B's combos with the commander. And it's not like Tivit or Malcolm decks where it's just, oh, just Glinthorn or just Time Seed. There's like, I think, four Bs to niv as it's A and you have A in the command zone. So having that multitude of possibilities to form that a plus a plus b combo i think adds a lot of consistency as well as a, a good bit of resilience it's a deck that synergizes incredibly well i'm going to talk about synergy versus card quality a lot during this and for me like niv is a deck with really really high synergy but one of its weaknesses is that that synergy is almost non-existent without its commander it really really needs niv to matter so it's a deck that's super commander centric and like waffle said it, it just lacks tutors uh, I think it's one of its big weaknesses, being able to get the exact pieces it needs consistently. If it did yeah, have tutors, I think it'd be broken. <laughs> a card draw is its tutors in this case. It just draws yeah. its way to whatever card it needs, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I'll talk. I'll talk more about Niv too when I get to when I get to it because it's still a little sure. higher up for me. Let, a, let us know your number fourteen, Max. Okay, so number fourteen is my Mardu deck, and it is not Timna Jessica. It is Dahada, okay. um, and I, you know I think Dahada is an interesting one. And I really had a hard time. Uh, figuring out if it really fit here at 14. Here's what I love about Dahada, okay? Dahada is one of the most explosive turbo decks in the format. Uh, in my opinion, there's only one other turbo deck, uh, besides Florian, of course, that, that's in, in, in my top 15 and capable of just getting underneath all of these mid-range decks that are out there. And to me, that's Dahada. And it's super resilient, super powerful. You get all the, all the access to all that white protection that you need um, you know, to just protect straight up turbo explosion wins with Bolas of Citadel and Underworld Breach. I mean, really, that's how that deck functions. Um, and then, you know, it, it's just it's just a, a incredibly resilient turbo deck. You know, it, it it will take a shot 
and then fill the graveyard again and take another shot. And it does, does a great job. The only reason it doesn't rank higher for me is because it completely lacks uh, any card draw uh, in, in the command zone at all. Um, you know, you're, you really don't have a lot of card draw in those colors typically. So it's just it's just difficult for it to, to, to draw its way into those grindy games. It really needs to explode in the early turns and get there. And if it doesn't get there early, it's gonna struggle a bit late. Um, so that's why I have it at 14. Yeah, Dihada is a, a super cool one. It's it's a deck I've played against almost more than any other deck. It's probably in like the top five decks I've faced the most times. I have a ton of respect for Dihada. It's not that I think it is a bad deck by any means. I just, I'm not super high on Mardu, and I think I would take a little more card advantage and mid-range resiliency over the possible explosion of Dihada. But that's personal preference, and I, I totally get why Dihada would be in someone's top 15. Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely a powerful deck as well. Um, but I don't know, I just feel like... Um... Mardu is just the, the silences and being hard to interact with is really fantastic but I, I just often want to be in Grixis and that's that's just where I've been at recently uh, <laughs> but Mardu can definitely pack a punch I agree so what's your yeah, so, what's your 14 so yep my 14 is Inala so this is definitely an interesting choice for me because I don't think this is like a meta deck as in it's not played very often but i do think it's a very powerful deck and it's one of the decks that like when i see this at the table i tremble a little bit like it's terrifying um if you don't keep a hand with uh you know really really uh, early interaction free interaction you could just be dead um i think one of the things on these tier lists that sometimes gets left out is that just because it's not the best grixis deck because obviously i don't think it is doesn't mean that uh it's it's not a great deck right like grixis colors are just so powerful right now uh you get all the blue interaction you get black tutors um and you get red again dockside breach it's just yeah, so powerful yeah and this is such a unique list with the eminence ability from anala where you get spellseeker as a one card win con and it's so easy to get spellseeker all you need is mana and but you need four mana and spellseeker and that's it it's like the lowest barrier to winning the game like period which is really cool that being said, I do think that oftentimes the reason this is not higher in the list is it's it is easy to interact with if you're ready, and uh, talented pilots will that respect the list can often disrupt it really well. Like it's it, it fo uh, fails against graveyard hate and just counter spells and even removal if you do it at the right time. So uh, definitely um, one of those where it has to be uh, or usually you want to be first. And, uh, but, but there's some definitely interested lists that I've seen recently. Tainted has done really well with his version of the list that just has been cutting other interaction to just like go faster. It's basically Rakdos splashing blue <laughs> for a tiny bit of protection and spell seeker. So I think that's a really interested take on it that hasn't been explored fully. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely a powerful deck, but it still comes down at 14 due to those uh, noted weaknesses. It's funny you brought up Tainted because that him playing that Anala deck was what made me and my buddy Cart work on his Rog side deck and what we considered the CABR counter spells are bad. Just go for speed. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like yep. Anala a lot. My my biggest problem with Anala is just the consistency. Like it's one of those things. It's a very streaky deck where if you hit a nice uh, luck, like luck patch, you could just straight up win a tournament like out of nowhere. Um, but you can also you know get a bad luck streak and just not win anything. It's it you know it can it can turn on you pretty hard. So that's my only problem with Anala, and that's not why it didn't make my top fifteen. But I think it is a really strong deck. I mean, the deck is strong and it's fast. And the one thing you have to give Anala credit for is it gets to run all of the Grixis Wind Cons, the Underworld Breeze package, the Thassa's Oracle package, but it gets to yep. add the Spellseeker lines on top of that. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And uh, going into number 13 for me here, Waffle, you've done a fantastic job transitioning because we just get to trade Grixis decks here. I put Crown Kevin. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I really like Crumb. Nice. It's, it's a deck that I have not played against too much. And so there's absolutely a chance I'm misranking it. It's a deck I was very intrigued by. I will always remember the first time I saw Sharky's list. It was maybe like three or four months ago. Coming from casual, one card I always loved to break was Mystic Reflection. And so seeing a CDH deck that was actually taking advantage of Mystic Reflection, using Tevish's token to make two Dock Sides, two Gilded Drakes, whatever, made me so excited. And I've kind of loved the deck ever since 
with the concept. I think your version doesn't run Mystic Reflection, which boo on you, I guess. Um, but we're, 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 we're talking Sharkies <laughs> here because obviously Sharky is the, the premier pilot on Chrome Tevish. Uh, and when I'm looking at Chrome Tevish as a deck, the things that are coming to mind, it gets to run all of the Grixis turbo win cons, almost in the same way that Blue Farm is just like mid range deck running the turbo win cons. Chrome Tevish does the same, but it gets to add mid range with better resiliency compared to something like Rog's Eye or even Anala. I would say it just has much better mid range resiliency with that card advantage in the command zone. I almost call it like a Grixis version of Tim Jeska in a similar fashion. Um, Tevish by himself, though, Tevish is a broken magic card that honestly, I wonder if it should be played in the 99 more in certain things. It is so much card advantage in the command zone. It spirals out of control and dominates the game way better than people gave it credit for. Like it will often be creating creatures, drawing multiple things. It has combos with it, where if you're using Displacer Kitten or Hallbreaker Horror, like he is a combo piece as well as a card advantage engine. You get to use a bunch of niche high synergistic cards like Mr. Reflection I talked about. The problem with the deck and where I think it is a little bit weaker is that it's weak to all of the same turbo hate that you get against other Grixis decks. Like pretty much all of those same interactive pieces work really well against this, but it doesn't have the generic speed of some of the other Grixis decks is where it falls a little bit short. And that's why I'm not going to have it as high up as something like Rogsai or Anala was one I considered and I decided to leave off for now. Um, but I think not being able to have as many options for beating that hate with speed holds it back a little bit for me because this deck does not, I don't even know, does Sharky run Adnaz? I would assume he does, right? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. he's one hundred percent runs that noise. Yeah, so like this this deck definitely gnaws is worse than other Grixis decks. You know what I mean? Um, but but it's it's a great deck. It's very very powerful. It's something I hope to play against a lot more soon. Uh, and I think it is underrepresented. And I think more people should be giving the deck another shot because it is super powerful. Yep, that yeah, is I, on my list I, too. So I will definitely talk more about it when we get there. Uh, I I think I I have it a little higher up. You'll see, but uh, for sure. definitely fantastic deck. And again, one of those where one person has just carried the deck and it just proves that like hey a fantastic pilot can really make these decks work and i think that's just like th that's kind of a cool thing about the format is that there may be some undiscovered decks because people just the good pilots haven't picked them up yet so i think that's mm -hmm. that's kind of cool yeah i have yeah, yeah. i have i have tevish Krom just outside of my top 15 like just barely like i if you look at my screen if you were looking at my screen there's a little line and just under that line is is tevish Krom. <laughs> uh, you know, my, my my biggest thing about that deck is is Sharky warps it. You know, Sharky is just an incredible pilot. Um, so I think he takes that deck to another level. Um, and I, I just haven't seen it as much outside of Sharky do what it does in Sharky's hands. Which is kind of like, I guess, anti... Like, I really had a hard time with this one. Because like, I really wanted to stuff it into the 15. If only I could put 16 decks in 15, I would have done it. It was just really close. Um, but I guess with that, I'll, I'll, I'll save my... Uh, my number 13 deck, and that is a control deck, Malcolm Timna. Um, nice. You know, and I, I, I think, you know, other than Niv Mizzet, uh, it's the other control deck uh, that's, that's, that's consistently done well, and not just recently, for a long time. Um, you know, and what it really brings to the table is it brings, you know, the Esper control package. All right, you get everything you want from a control perspective. You get removal, you get, uh, you know, the Grand Abolisher silence effects, you get all of the counter magic you could ever want. You get the draw engines with Esper Sentinel, uh, Mystic Remora, Ristic Study, One Ring. You get all of that package all put together. Uh, the biggest weakness of the deck, in my opinion, is the fact that it just really has one uh, win condition. That's really just, you know, Thassa's Oracle. Um, and it runs, you know, typically it runs Lab Man as a backup. Um, and that's it. That's that's really it. Now, you, know, you have ways to get there. You run Adnaz, you run Doomsday. Um, but other than that, there's just, the, the deck's not going to close the game other than specifically Thoracle wins. Um, but other than that, it's, it, it generates resources with Malcolm. It generates card draw with Timna. I mean, what more could you want? Um, and consistently puts up results over a long period of time. Yeah, so, the deck has actually 13. been killing it lately. Like, that is that is one of the decks I will have a little bit higher because it, it has lately been destroying people in tournaments. Yeah, uh, so that's that's my number thirteen as well. So nice. okay, perfect. Um, and uh, yeah, we can't uh, we can't leave out Ben Loeb when talking about Malcolm Timna. He has just performed for so long. Um, just he's he's a house on that deck. And I think it's interesting because I um, I see the weaknesses of the deck a little bit differently. I definitely think that the it it does somewhat lack win cons as far as uh, good win cons because it doesn't have breach. I mean, really. Esper, my issue with Esper right now is that it just it just can't go quite as fast. The nozzles just aren't as good, and it just missing Dockside and Breach is so important right now for that kind of deck. So 
those are those are that's usually kind of how i feel about esper um and i think that's really what's holding it back maybe if the if some more cards get printed esper i think could be uh definitely the one of the best uh three color uh three combination of colors in the format but yeah timna and malcolm one of the cool things about this list is both of those commanders are so good they're just the best some of the best commanders in the entire format which is really really cool um and so i think that really is one of the things that carries it i agree with you that like the silences are super powerful and i i honestly probably would have this higher up on my tier list if more people were playing the deck i think it's one of those things where again we are rating this on best pilots but um something we'll talk about when we get to Darko Thrasios is that like if you just don't have a huge sample size it is somewhat hard to know where it truly falls um on the 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 meta in the meta so definitely definitely a powerful deck um i will say that you do get mnemonic betrayal and crater's grasp at least in my personal list i'm running those so i think i'm not yeah that's why i'm not quite as worried about win cons but they're just not again they're just not as good if you have to steal your opponent's win cons um but yeah definitely definitely a very powerful commander pairing yeah which I, I'll, I'll get to it a little more when it comes up on my list which is a few a few slots down but it is just kind of generic esper where it's like oh we get mana and card advantage in the command zone we get solid esperness but it is kind of like bad tibet in my mindset where it just is missing some of the additional power and win conditions that tibet brings to the table yeah i will i will say i have played malcolm timna and i found it pretty boring um mm -hmm. it, it's it's it, which you know take that as you will that's not a, a good qualifier for what a great deck is uh, just you know i found it boring when i played it i think that's really that's a good point just to dive in for half a second is that like this it's interesting with competitive edh because a lot of the decks that are performing um sometimes aren't the most interesting decks and i think malcolm Timna, i think you're totally right i think it is just one of those decks that is just like it it's not necessarily interesting you're just putting just good stuff two good commanders in the list and be like all right well it works like tim is good malcolm's good what could go wrong um and I, so it is interesting that like from a competitive mindset sometimes you do really just have to ignore okay maybe personality of the deck isn't that important important if i want to win tournaments and i think that's going to be uh it's definitely something that i think warps people's perspectives of the meta um for for good and for bad but uh just something to keep in mind when when choosing your list is that your personal bias for what you like to play or what is cool to see might not necessarily be what's best to win so maybe something to keep in mind throughout this conversation yeah. yeah, that's fair. But, you know, but I will say also to add to that, my favorite thing about CDH as a format is that there's so much room. Like there's so many decks that are, you know, can perform well in a perform in, in a tournament. So you have the option of, of picking something that you might like a little bit more. Uh, I mean, not at the not at the cost of not being good in the tournament, but like there's there are other decks to choose from. So you can you know play around a little bit, find a style that that suits you, find something that. You, know, you enjoy playing and can succeed with and you can you can accomplish all of that at the same time i agree yeah, we're I going mean, over uh, 15 lists rather than <laughs> just four that can compete and there's yeah. more outside these these 15 decks that definitely can compete so i think that's that is something that's really cool about cdh yeah i mean yeah. and obviously I, I don't think any of us have pat yova turns for example in our top 15 but like that deck just took down a tournament and i think it's done it before a few years Absolutely. back as well you know what i mean like it, it is crazy compared to something like modern where modern you you have the you know top eights and the top eights like oh it's amulet titan scam and whatever other deck and there's like two or three of each of those and that's it that's the top eight yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, get, you get you get like four viable decks maybe yeah. five in 60 card formats that's just the way it is you know, yeah this is cdh is unique in that way we're lucky yeah we are <laughs> yeah and yeah. jumping into our to our 12th deck uh, I have one that I think some people might assume I have a little bit low, but this is where I'm at on the deck right now. I have Bruce Thrasios at 12. Uh, this is a deck that if you flash back to when I first started playing CDH, I think a lot of people would have it like number four. Like this deck was destroying people. It was the deck that I looked at every time I was playing Cannon, and I was wondering if I should be playing this instead. It is mid-range creature combo dot deck. It has very solid card quality. It has very solid synergy. It has an outlet and card advantage in the command zone. Its combos can be difficult to interact with since they are all creature-based. It's pretty much a Simic deck that gets to have the explosiveness of red paired with the protection of white. I think I would have the deck a lot higher, <laughs> generically in my mind, if they started playing Underworld Breach. I still don't know why they don't. <laughs> I, I get why they don't, because they're like, oh, we don't need the slots for that, we don't need that, but like, I think it would make your deck more powerful, and I think it's something they should definitely look to. Um, I think that where Bruce Thrass is hit in the meta, it's just 
weak to decks that are faster than it, and it gets locked out really, really easily by like Curse Totem and Graph Digger's Gauge Effects. And it just starts to not function in the same way. And it's a deck that, I don't know, it stopped seeing as much play. And there's still a few top tier pilots on it, like Dan Brown, who do really, really well with the deck. And they're able to do that consistently. But when I've played against the deck lately, it's not a matchup that I look at and I'm like, oh, this is scary. You know, there, which mm-hmm. there's going to be a bunch of decks I talk about soon that I'm like, oh, I have to like prepare for this. When I see Bruce Thrasios against the table, I'm like, oh, cool, sweet. I can like kind of be relaxed on this one because I just like know how the deck works. I know which pieces to stop. I know when they look scary. They don't get to hide as much, I think, as a deck that falls into a similar category like Dark Earth Rassios. I think they tend to be a little bit more on board with what they're doing. So it's a tad more telegraphed with what they're capable of. Um, yeah, and I don't know. The deck, it's one that seems like it should be stronger than it is, and it has been stronger than I think it currently is. But right now, I feel like it's just a bit lacking. Absolutely. I just jump to jump in there. I'll talk about mine in a second. It is very near it, it, mine is not in 12th but i i will i do have bruce Theras in a very similar spot and um yeah i agree with you i think the deck it would be a, it performing better if it was just built a little different i think it's just outdated deck building personally um but hopefully some some good pilots pick that new era of deck building up with breach with uh just a little bit of a different mindset going into the deck and perform well i do think that like i i have a, a personal friend who's a fantastic pilot who consistently performs on this deck and it just does so well and so uh, he's actually playing in the in the uh, event this weekend for a time twister so hey maybe maybe this uh oh, this list will change we'll see but uh <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. definitely good points uh, yeah it, it's an interesting deck to me because you know cdh has kind of these waves to it uh, and there was a, a definitely a Dawn Waker wave that, that that happened, I don't know, six months ago, eight months ago, where it was just dominating the format. And then I think the interest in it has kind of fallen off um, when it when I think there was an emergence of turbo wins for a little bit there. And that kind of pushed it out because it is a, a bit slower as compared to other decks. Um, but I, I also think the partner pairing itself has tremendous potential still uh, and like you said i think there's a lot of innovation that's been going on in the format and i think it's just a matter of time before that innovation uh makes its way into into these dawn waker decks and then i think we'll see a resurgence um, and i, I think they should cut dawn waker higher that's my spicy take yeah, some of them have don't don't run zerta <laughs> <laughs> that's my list i cut dawn waker don't even call it it's thrasio's bruise to me now <laughs> yeah i call yeah. it bad cannon but I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not personally trying to solve for this particular deck, so I have no idea what to put in there. What not put I've been. There. I've been cooking with this list. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. All right. What's your What's your yeah. number twelve, Max? What's your number twelve? Yeah. So my number twelve is Niv Mizzet. Um, you know, and again, you know, this goes to uh, credit to Shauna just being incredible as a pilot, and you know, really has put a lot of work into this deck. Uh, and what I love, you know, I've played against Shauna a number of times at this point, and what I love about the way she plays and the way this deck plays is there's there's sort of two phases to the game. The deck is built to really play a strong control game early, get some card advantage, you know, hold things together, um, force the table to to respect her, uh, respect the deck that that interaction could come at any point, and just hold it hold it down. And then at at some point there's this massive uh, pivot that happens, and th- and that really is. Uh, Niv Mizzet comes down and then from that point to the end of the game at any moment literally any time uh, at instant speed or not she could just win the game um, and the whole table has to be on notice and and just expect that it's going to happen at any time um, and that that uh, impending doom that you feel when playing against that deck is why I have it ranked where I do because uh, it's just it's just you know it's a it's a juggernaut and I think I think frankly you know outside of Shauna I think if more people picked up this deck and ran it i think they'd have success as well i think this this deck has more legs than 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 people realize so i'm a big fan big fan of the uh my number 12 is also carried by a single pilot and it is ikra dargo <laughs> um i think this list is super underrated uh connor has been basically the sole champion of this list other people are playing it but connor's pretty much the only one who is you know, taking these top finishes, uh, best known by, uh, I believe it was Punt City 2, correct? Where he got his Peer into the Abyss deflecting swatted by uh, Brian yes. Kovar himself. Oh, so, no. you know, it's, it's, it's got some bad publicity too, but the deck is very strong. I've lost to it 
more times than I would like to admit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting deck. Obviously, I, I love Dargo. <laughs> I, I uh, definitely try to specialize in Dargo a little bit. And I think that it, what's interesting about this list is you have a fantastic commander, which is Dargo, and a terrible commander, which is Ikra. And I think that's what does hold the deck back to the 12th slot. It, um, but at the same time, Dargo is just such a good combo piece. You are able to get Razaketh onto the onto the board very easily with pod effects, and then Dargo just enables you to tutor as many things as you want from your deck uh, with Jewel Dotus and uh, LED. So definitely very, very powerful. You get uh, black tutors, uh, and you get red for breach. And interestingly enough, I think green is very important in this list because you get greater good, which is just the best Dargo engine out there. It's basically, it just you just win. You cast greater good, you win the game as long as you have a tiny bit of mana left over, um, which is just fantastic. But of course, the downsides are it's a bad partner in Ikra and it lacks blue. So you know, I, I this is the only this is the only non-blue deck in my entire tier list because I think blue is just so powerful right now. If you don't have interaction, um, you have to be making up for it in a lot of very other ways, which I do think this deck does. Yeah, this deck, which if we got into, I think at the end we might mention a few honorable mentions who didn't quite make our cuts that we just wanted to give a shout out for. Igra Dargo is one of the first decks I was going to name. Yeah. I've, I've played against this deck a few times. It is shockingly powerful. And I, I genuinely think it is right up there with like Rog on speed. This deck is wildly fast. Can and be faster the, sometimes. Yeah, no, it, like it can actively go for turn two wins regularly. I've never seen it do turn one, but I've heard it is capable of doing that kind of thing. Especially because Dargo, Dargo just has that cost reduction. And if you're able to like cheat out a Razakath or something like that, oh, cool, Jewel Lotus is triple tutors. Like that's just what that means. It's a Jewel Lotus equals three demonic tutors through your deck directly into your hand and you just win the game. So it has these incredibly explosive lines. It can take a lot of different directions going the Dargo lines, going the like Ad Nauseam period of the style line. Are they on Ad Nauseam or no? Oh, yeah. Totally. Okay, it is on Ad. It's a little rough when you're on like Pure to Davis and Razakath and stuff, but yeah, you'd hope to know. Nah, that, I suppose. Nah, you're good. You're, <laughs> you're good. good. It'll go fast you're enough. <laughs> I mean, you have red and black, though. You have red and black, so you have the best ritual colors. You have all the positive mana production. And Ad Nauseam is not about how much your CMC is and how deep you can go. It's about how much mana you can create and if you can hit tutors. That's what matters. Yep. And yeah, this is a deck that makes mana, and it Dargo inherently gives you access to so many tutors. So, and, so, and so, has a high density of win cons, which is super yeah. important, I think. So, that's definitely something to keep in mind. So, so interesting question. So this is your only non-blue deck in the top 15. So does that mean that Tyam is not in your top 15? Not anymore. No, I guess we should talk about Tyam for a second. Cause Ty nah. if this was, if, <laughs> no, you're right. Never mind. No, we're good. No, no, no uh, if this was, if this was a, if this was a month or two ago, I think Tyam <laughs> would be absolutely here. Um, but I think that Tyam, Tyam is somewhat dead due to the 75 minute rounds. Um, and I think that it is one of those things where I don't think, so similar to the Winota effect where Winota got discovered, people respected it and it stopped winning. I think Tyam isn't that, but I do think it has had a similar effect. People know to look two or three turns ahead with Tyam. And if they can see where it's going, they are able to stop it consistently. And I think that right. is something that's interesting. It's like, if you just consistently use your removal before it's won, it can never get its legs under it. And, and, and good pilots will know to do that. That being said, I think there are some really, really fantastic pilots on the deck that have had really consistent, good performances. Uh, Black Bolt, Pixel, Tuka, obviously Zen, the goat of Tyam. He's, he's, you know, the only person to win two Mox Masters. Uh, amazing. But yeah, I, I, that's, that's, I just don't think uh, in, in a faster meta, where the deck is now very mainstream and dis mainstream and discovered i don't think it can uh fully compete anymore i don't think it i don't think it can't compete i don't think it's as good as the, any of any of these other lists on the top 15 at this point in time i would so, 100 so let agree. me 100 percent let me let, let me let me say this first let me, i want to be clear so i have a ton of respect for zen i have a ton of respect for tuka and, and pixel and, and black bolt and all the work that, they, that went into developing this deck i like those guys i play with them quite a bit I enjoy playing with them. Um, and then with that said, you know, here's my technical reason why uh, Tyam is not in my top 15. Uh, because fuck Tyam. That's why. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I was yep. gonna, dude, I was going to say the same thing. I was going to say the same thing. No, generally, <laughs> I think, I think no. you need to change your slogan to number two Tyam hater. I am the number one Tyam hater. Fuck this deck. But like, not genuinely, anymore. if, if, we, if we flash back a couple months, I think just based on tournament success alone, I would have had to at least put it on the list. And I probably would have had it somewhere around number 10 at that point. Um, but I, I genuinely believe 
I like what you said, where you said like people people have a little more respect for it, and they're they're wise to when to interact with it. I, I've always said that tie in is a deck that just preys on ignorance. It is a parasitic pile of garbage. Hundred percent. That just that 100%. just takes advantage of people's lack of knowledge and gaslights is is really how it goes. Hundred um, percent. And and I yep. really like how you put it as people are able to look ahead with time because in my conversations with time pilots when they've been frustrated about people interacting with them so early and they're like why would someone need to do this right now and it's because they don't feel like people should interact with them until it's too late to interact with them. And I think it's really important when stopping a deck like Taya, where it just kind of hits that climax where you hit the point of no return, where it once it looks like it's time to interact, it is too late. You have to get ahead of it. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. And I'll, I'll, I'll add to that real quick. You know, the reason why I think Max is the number one Taya hater, and, and I, I use the word Max because it's both of us, Right, it's because I think both of us had a frustrating period where we played against Tyam a whole bunch, and I think you know both you and I had a pretty good understanding of how to play against Tyam and how to beat Tyam. And I found myself continually in pods where I was the only one who knew that. And you know, you see people make you know, you know, opportunities to interact where they just let it go, and you, and you lose games because, like you said, they're just ignorant to how Tyam worked. Um, you know, fortunately, I think we're past that time now. I think you're much less likely to find yourself in a pod where people don't know how to play against it. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a time period there where, man, it was frustrating. And, and I think that's where my deep-seated hatred for the deck comes from. Yeah. But no, now really, it is it, time it, to move on. Yes, it is. Where we have transitioned beautifully <laughs> into my picks because my, <laughs> my number 11 is the last non-blue deck on my list. Uh, at number 11, I have Kyrick, Son of Yogmoth. A deck that I think is eternally, eternally disrespected. And I remind you once again, we are imagining best pilot. And so I'm imagining someone of Fonzie's skill level running this deck. I think that Kyrick, Son of Yogmoth is without a doubt, unquestionably, the fastest deck in the format at a consistent level. It is insanely consistent. No deck can go for more turn one wins. If you don't have interaction, this deck can go for a turn two win every single game without fail. This deck has a wild amount of synergy. It is far more resilient than it's initially given credit for because it can just keep going for wins when it gets stopped though it is very very easy to stop it is a glass cannon that will fold its win line on an, any individual turn to almost a single piece of interaction every single time the deck is yep. stupidly reliant on kirik until it gets set up once it's set up with like a villas or something then they can tell kirik to go fuck itself they don't care anymore they'll let you take it away and kill it they don't care once they're set up though but it it takes a little bit for them to get to that point and like if you have the interaction to deal with them at that point you probably should have dealt with them first anyway this deck is absolutely terrifying to play against, which is part of where I'm considering it so high. I don't think there is any other deck in the entire format that has as much of an effect on how your opponent's mulligan than Kyrick. And considering it as like a powerful deck, sure, the card quality individually is pretty low, but when you have Kyrick on board, the card quality becomes insane because everything is just giving you a win line. And this you want to talk about density of win cons? The amount of different positions this deck can be in and find a line to win the game is absolutely bonkers. I think it's eternally underrated. I would love if it got some better pilots on the deck, which I saw even whatever tournament it was like a few weeks ago. You know, like three yeah, people Festival submitted yeah. three people submitted Kirik and two of them top sixteen. Like the deck is bonkers. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. It, it it doesn't even make my top twenty five. So yeah, this sure. is the first deck where, where I feel like you know I I I don't agree. Like I I understand that like it is in, incredibly explosive at times. Uh, the problem I have with it is just so inconsistent. Like it you know there are games where it does absolutely nothing. It has no ability to interact with the table. It can't. It it, it just sits it there like a helpless baby and watches. Yeah yeah. It, it sits there like a helpless baby and 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 just loses the game. Um, you know. And that, that to me is why I just can't rank it uh, anywhere close to the top 15. But like I, I do respect the deck as explosive. You're right in the sense that when I sit down at the table, like even at Festival of Nights, I played against it. Um, and I sit down at the table and the first thing I did was like, hey, blue players, we need to have a talk <laughs> yeah. before we even start the game. Because it is, it is incredibly dangerous and 
if, you know, talk about preying on ignorance. If you don't know what I was going to do, say that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. If you, you will get got real quick. <laughs> yep. No, yeah, I, and I think I, that's why it does so well in the Swiss, right? It's yeah. that it's, it's really good if people don't know how good it is. Uh, like, cause then, then it can just run away with the game and no one's going to interact at the right moments. But I do think that like, I, I do have to agree with Max, Max P <laughs> that, um, this deck does when, when opponents respect it properly i do think it struggles and so that's why i think that it's it is hard for it to fully win a tournament because once it gets to the top 16 then it, it it i think it performs a lot a lot worse uh than in the swiss that, that's how i see it i do think the deck is strong but yeah i agree i, I don't have it uh, this wasn't in the in the running for me on the top 15. yeah i, I figured this one might be controversial to, to some extent i figured this is what we might argue a little bit with not argue discuss um it's yeah. definitely a personal respect from the deck i've played against it a bunch i've, I've gotten to play against pro on kirik a bunch of times uh and it is it is totally fragile but the reason that, and I've kind of talked about how I don't like how decks are fragile, and that's definitely a huge weakness of Kyrick. The only reason that I personally rate Kyrick so high is because it is the only deck in the format that I can truly trust to like have a turn one win, and I have to, 100%, have to mulligan for free interaction to deal with it. Yep, that's fair. I agree. I agree with yep. that. Yeah. So I guess I guess with that I'll go to my number eleven. We're eleven now. Is that right? Yeah. Now? Yeah, we're at eleven. All right. My number eleven is Kenrith, um, and you know this is an interesting one because I could see ranking it much higher than this. But uh, you know what I found with this deck is it's kind of the the worst of the five color commanders. Um, you know, and it's kind of confusing as to why, um, you know, because, you know, you'd think it would do much better in tournaments. You know, it has all the tools that you could ever need. Um, and it does, you know, pop in the top 16 from time to time, pop in the top four from time to time, but it doesn't consistently show up. Um, and, you know, you watch the, the deck kind of, um, just fold on itself in, in, in the hands of, you know, other than the best, the best pilots that I've seen. Um, you know, it, it is, I think, much stronger lately with, you know, the kitten combo with Teferi. I think that's the way that deck really should be going. Um, but, you know, it, it's not a strong Adnos deck. It's not a particularly strong Breach deck. Uh, it's sort of like the Jack of all trades, Master of None deck. Um, so that's, that's, that's where I have it ranked. I don't know what you guys think of that. Is that too low? What do you think? I have it a little higher. Um, I have it, it barely it, higher. Yeah, it, it was it was probably I think for me the hardest deck to individually place because I, I knew it was going to be on my top fifteen, but deciding where mm -hmm. to put it was extremely difficult because you build this deck nine different ways, and it's not like yeah. oh I choose this win con or I choose this win con. It's oh some of them are five color Nas decks and some of them are five color I'm built around Kenrith decks, like they're yeah. completely yep. different and they're all really really strong. All I know is that when I sit down at a table and I see Kenrith at the table, you know, my thought process is, all right, well, I'm not going to get, you know, turboed out by it. I'm not going to get smothering controlled out of it. You know, it's 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 going to do everything pretty good, uh, but it's not going to be, you know, completely dominant in any one particular category, um, which makes me feel a little bit more comfortable because I'm not, I, you know, I don't have to worry about being cut off from a complete access of the game by that deck. I mean, there are Turbo Kenrith decks, though. That's 100% a thing. Like, I think the guy who top three on Kenrith, uh, Espen, last time was playing, like, a pretty much Turbo Nas version. My, my son plays the Turbo version. I mean, he, he you know, and it, it can do its thing, but it's not as as explosive as the other decks that are really doing Turbo. Uh, For sure. Yep. So. For sure. I'll save a couple of my thoughts. I'll talk about my, my listing of Kenrith in a moment, but. Yeah. What's um, your number 11, Waffle? Thrasios Brews, so we're all pretty close with these. Um, yeah, I, I talked about it a little bit, but I, I do think that the the reason this is... I, I don't have Don Wicker on my top 15. I have Thrasios Brews on my top 15. And I, 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 no disrespect on that old deck. I think the deck was fantastic. I just... I really don't think that it keeps up anymore. That, that's all it comes down to. I do think you just have to build the deck a little differently now. Um, <laughs> I have three things written down here. Breach is good, One Ring yep. is good, and Thrasios is good. So, like, <laughs> I mean, you can't go too wrong with the deck. Um, like, th th there's there's a couple, like, inherent issues, and the issues are Bruce Tarl kind of sucks. Um, yes, you can get a Seedborn out of it, right, with uh, with Neoform, Eldritch, whatever. Like, that that's that's good, but, like, you're still paying a lot of mana for a Seedborn. It's, and, two, and, like, two cards. It's, it's not great. Um... But at the same time, you do get these very, very uh, high, this very high card quality. 
um the, the cards are fantastic in the deck the combos are layered and uh that i love building decks that way especially non-black decks that don't get access to a plus b combos with tutors um you get you still have a plus b combos but you don't always tutor for all the pieces you uh you know you fall into value lines that end up winning the game later with another combo so i think that's really cool um, as I mentioned in my personal um, brewing with the list, I've cut Zerda, although Zerda still might be good enough, but the, the, the deck is not about Zerda anymore. It's about these creature, these hard to interact with creature combos like Emil and Dockside, and then just good cards. You have, you have, you have Breach to win the game, um, and you have all these good creature tutors to get Dockside out, and um, I'm on one ring in Derevi, which is just so sick. <laughs> I think this, this this is one of the best one ring decks, I think. Um, and I think that's a little bit underexplored. So, but but we've talked about these these decks that have pilots that champion them. Ian used to be that pilot, and that's one of the reasons it got so popular. But we don't have a recent pilot that is on a newer version of this list uh, to champion the list. So I would really be interested to see if my ranking for Thrasios Bruise changes if we see some pilots come out and really just take off with this list and get a couple top fours or tournament wins. Yeah, I mean, me, me and you are on, like, so much the same page with Bruce Fast. And, and like, I, I would say it is the deck below the top 10 on mine that is by far the most likely to jump up higher quickly if mm. someone just does right by the deck. But it was funny. I think me and Waffle had a conversation the other day where we both were like, oh, we want to brew Bruce Thrasios. <laughs> and my, my one question for him, I was like, I need you to, to tell me one thing to know if we're on the same page about this deck. Do you put Underworld Breach in your list? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, we're on the same page. <laughs> like, yep. Uh, I do 100%. love the one ring Drevi, though. I think that is that is absolutely a really cool way to go with it. It just adds another layer of explosive card advantage. And especially because you're already a seed board deck where you therefore mm -hmm. just want the one ring paired with it because sure, it doesn't win the game by itself, but it does win the game by itself. Like it's not the technical win condition, but it does win the game. Derevi gives you another option instead of seed board and that does essentially the same thing, but in almost more of like a Dargo greater good explode fashion. Agreed. 100% agreed. So really, really hope to see that uh, in some tournament results soon. Yeah. Moving on to the top 10. And I put a little bit more respect on my number 10 deck than you guys put on it. Uh, not too much higher, but I put Malcolm Timna. Uh, this deck has been crushing it in tournaments lately. It is absolutely boring. It is as generic Esper as it possibly gets. It's literally just bad Tibet, where it's the same Esper bullshit without the A plus B combo, but the same idea of you get mana advantage and card advantage in your command zone. It can get off the running a little bit faster than Tivit, which is something I do think you need to give it credit for. You know, it has lots more like one card win cons where compared to Tivit, this some Malcolm Timna decks are on Adnaz or on Doomsday or they're on Necro to try to utilize that. It has really, really overall high card quality, but it is just low on overall synergy and it's more just a generically good deck. Yeah, fair. I mean, I think I think I agree with everything you said there. I, you know, I think it's it's that deck that's going to most consistently and for the longest term stay in that top fifteen. Yeah, and I just don't see it ever falling out. Like no matter how the meta changes, I think it's still going to stay solidly in that top fifteen somewhere. All right. So okay. yeah. Yep. yep. So I guess my number ten is Sisse. Um, you know, obviously the five color Sisse, not the Celestine is to say, um, you know, I think this deck, um, you know, it, it is a, it's, it's got that juggernaut factor, right? Where it, it feels very, very difficult to stop, right? It, 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 there's not a lot of places to interact with it, you know, other than, you know, the, there are some silver bullets that affect it in terms of like opposition agent and graph diggers cage, but outside of the silver bullets, like you're just not, you're gonna have a really hard time stopping this deck from doing its thing with interaction. Um, and in the hands of, of, of the best pilots, which is really what we're considering, like in my mind, that's uh, Malcolm, um, Malcolm Beckford. Uh, this deck is, is consistently a house. And it, you know, every time you, you see it at the table, like you're, you're going to struggle against it. Like you might find a way to stop it. You might find a way to win under it, uh, but, but you're going, you're in for a slog fest. It's a very difficult deck to, to deal with. Um, you know, and the, and the other thing that makes it especially difficult is just that there's so many goddamn ways to build the deck. All right, so you sit down at the table and you're like, okay, there's Sisse. Which Sisse is it? <laughs> you know, what what what's the pieces I need to stop? And, and it's really difficult to know that because there's just so many variations on it. So, you know, it really preys on that ignorance factor. 
um, and 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 keeps you ignorant even if you feel like you know the deck. Um, so I I think it's I think it's it is definitely my tenth deck. Uh, I feel very comfortable with it there. Um, I could even move it up a couple of spots. I think the deck is very strong. Yep, I'll, I'll talk more about it. Mine, mine's coming up very soon. So, mine is also <laughs> I agree, coming I agree up with all your points very soon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no spoilers, Max. No spoilers. Yeah, 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 yeah. we might, <laughs> well, we might all be about on the same page with that one. So we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, get to that one. I, I love how we didn't talk about this. We are, we are like very close, like one off on a lot of these because my number ten is Kenra. Uh, so I don't want to go into it again too much because we've already talked about it, but the the thing about this and i did mention this with grixis as well is that um just because it's not the best five color commander doesn't mean it is not an, a very good one so i i just think kenrith is, is still a very strong deck i kind of I actually think it's that's why i have it a little higher than what you were saying is i i think this deck is very powerful especially like i think it can one of the issues and one of the reasons i think it gets rated lower is i think it can be built built poorly sometimes um because there's so much room uh, obviously that's subjective but uh you know i i've definitely seen some lists that i don't think are uh you know optimized and so i think that you know it's gonna keep that's part i think that's part of why it's inconsistent is because basically we've seen people playing entirely different decks just like you said it can be built a billion ways but yeah five color has to be good as long as you're as long as you're putting the good cards in the deck um it, it's still it, it still has synergies with the commander the commander can still grind it's got the fimage combo the dockside combos i love the fimage combo by the way i think that is so cool just because a lot of combo pieces are dead otherwise um or just not fantastic but kenrith combos with like the two of the best cards in the format well i mean fimage isn't one of the best cards in the format but it, it, it abuses the best card in the format which is dockside so i think that's really right. really cool right um and at the end of the day it's just a good good stuff pile with worse win cons than najila right uh so you know i i think the deck is is powerful but um i, I think it deserves the 10th slot in my opinion yeah, I mean, it's like, when, when you're comparing it to Najila, though, it loses the A plus Bs with Derevi and Grim Hireling type effects, but you do get this whole subset of combos that Najila doesn't get to take advantage of, which is the infinite mana combos, where Kenrith is an outlet commander. And there are a lot of ways in five colors to very easily assemble infinite mana. Um, yeah, my but the my other only thing... pushback is that, uh, is that Kenrith itself isn't a fantastic card, like, alone, whereas I think Najila is a fantastic card yeah. alone. No, I that's agree. really yeah uh, that's that's kind of why it's why, why Najila is not... much higher on our list yeah yeah we'll <laughs> right, talk right, about right. Najila later much later yeah much yeah, later. yeah 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 just just Ken yeah. kenrith on its own five drop kenrith with, when you don't have uh, you know anything that matters in hand uh, it's not really where you want to be but no i, I agree yeah. all right so getting into my number nine here uh one that we've it's been a long time since we've mentioned it i have to say weather like captain at number nine uh, another five color mm -hmm. deck. We just have mm -hmm. we're just talking a lot of five color decks right now that aren't as good as other five color decks. Uh, the thing with Sissy Weather, Weather Like Captain, you have to give it credit for recent tournament success. It has actually, I think, been the most successful deck in recent tournaments from like a top four in conversion percentage. The deck is wildly explosive. It has way more ways to win than it is giving credit for. It's not just like a linear, oh, Savala line or oh, Dockside line. It has tons of variations in how I can go about it. And that's why once Sisei gets set up, it's actually very difficult to interact with outside of specifically killing Sisei. Um, though with that, the deck is absolutely fucking non-functional without its commander. It is the most commander-centric deck that is in this kind of like higher tier, in my opinion. Uh, it like, if you Gilded Drake the Sisei, the deck pretty much can't win unless it just naturally draws every single combo piece in the mana to utilize them, which is not going to happen. And because of that, although the deck has this high variation of win lines, the game plan itself tends to be fairly linear, where it is just like, make mana, activate Sisei. Uh, the one thing I do love about the deck is the addition of Cauldron. This is by far, I think, the best Agatha Soul Cauldron deck in the com in the format. It got an enormous boost from that. And the other thing I really like about Sase is it fights through stacks significantly better than people think it does. Like obviously, Opposition Agent, Aven Mind Sensor wreck the deck on all fronts. I was gonna say, but, good card. But like, like yeah, <laughs> like those those specific cards completely ruin this deck. But like a lot of people I've seen, someone plays a Graph Digger's Cage, and the mindset of the table is, oh, I don't have to care about Sase anymore. Sase doesn't give a fuck about Graph Digger's Cage. Like sure, it, it can it can screw up specific things that they want to tutor for. If they want to tutor for their Savala, they can't. But in terms of like. Oh, the Graph Digger's Cage doesn't allow me to win. They are able to get Planeswalkers. They just get the Fairy Bounce the Graph Digger's Cage. It doesn't matter. Oh, they get Oko. They get rid of the Graph Digger's Cage. Like they have lots of ways to win through these specific Sadax pieces. And I think sometimes yep. 
people assume Sissé is out of the game far too early. Uh, and I think part of that comes from the other thing about Sissé. I think it is a deck that also preys on ignorance, kind of like we said, where I'm in a lot of games where I, you know, say to the table on my turn, I'm like, hey, do you guys realize that Sissé has win on board right now? And I get a no from the table. Like, what do you mean? And so he goes, how am I supposed to win? And I'm like, well, you can do this, 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 and this, and that's your exact win line for a deterministic win. And the guy's like, ah, you know it. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, they really do prey on the fact that people don't know how their deck functions. Yep. 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 Hundred percent agreed. Yeah, I, I got I got to say in the same slot. So I'll, sorry, Max. I'll, I'll just skip you we'll, to, we'll, for continuity. We'll jump, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go but, for it. Go for it. Go, I'll yeah. keep you talking after this because my nine will will keep you talking. So go ahead. Ooh, go ahead. I'm excited. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree with all your points. I think that um, the strength is, of course, that it's hard to interact with, and it is one of these one of these lists that does have like. Well, so it's interesting because I do think it has, in some ways, a really high card quality, but in some ways, a really low card quality. Like, yeah. you don't want to draw your combo pieces, but at the same time, it's a five color list. So, but like, it's one of those things where if you draw the wrong half of the deck, you're not necessarily in a great spot. Like, you, you can't always just cast uh, uh, three drop to fairy and pass the turn. It, it just doesn't work. You're going to lose. So, you, if that's stuck in your hand, you're, you're kind of sad. Um, and of course, Draneth, Oppo you're gonna die to those pieces but that being said it has very five uh very powerful five color cards and yeah uh, it, it's it's got weirdly enough uh, it's a meta deck with brewer's advantage which just mm -hmm. like you said is is very powerful and um yeah uh, malcolm malcolm beckford is a just he, he's so good on this deck he's got um an insane track record with it and he's proven that this deck can compete so um yeah, definitely, definitely think it, it is uh, deserving of its number nine slot. I do, I do appreciate that we all had it in the nine and ten because this is one I thought I might get a little shredded for putting this low with how well it's done lately. But I was like, I just, I don't know. It seems pretty linear. <laughs> like, like it's pretty commander centric. Yep. Yep. Like, yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're we're on actually we're on eight, right? This is number no, eight. no. We're on your number nine, Max. Uh, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, We we 10, skipped nine. Yes. One. There we yeah. go. Yes. All right, so my number nine is Dargo Thrasios. Um, <laughs> Yo. Okay, which is which is uh, you know for people listening that that is the deck that Freedom Year is known for. Um, and, and here's my thing with Dargo Thrasios is I think that in the late spring, uh, going into the summer, there was this you know everyone talked about the Mardu summer coming. Um, I don't think the Mardu summer ever really happened. I think what happened was <laughs> there was this. You know, other than Dahada, I don't think there was anything that really happened there. But what did happen was there was this rise of faster mid-range, more powerful mid-range decks. Um, and I think one of the decks that really exemplified that and really like left a uh, a mark on the format is this Dargo Thrasios deck. Um, you know, and and you know specifically what it does around you know um, you know what it could do with the one ring, what it could do with. You know, explosive wins just completely out of nowhere, leveraging Dargo and 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 pot effects. It's just it's just a much more powerful, more difficult mid range deck to deal with than anything people had seen, you know, prior to that. I mean, and you know, we keep talking about you know Bruce Thrasios. You know, Bruce Thrasios was kind of the gold standard for you know uh, mid range you know decks other than Blue Farm, um, and this turned that whole like existence completely on its head. Um, and accelerated the format as a whole uh, without giving up mid-range. Um, so I really respect this deck. I think it's um, it, it's it's a format warping deck. It changed you know what everyone was doing um, when it came came to the forefront. So I think it's I had a hard time ranking it because I, I really I could rank it a little even higher. Uh, but when you see my next deck, I think you'll understand why. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll just, I, I obviously have thoughts on this deck and I'll save most of them for, for my ranking of the deck. I have it a little higher and I will obviously give that I have some inherent bias. I will say that this is also a hard deck for me to rank just because the lack of pilots on this deck. Manila Midget is the uh, only other one that has definitely like, you know, been a, a champion of the deck. Um, and so we just haven't had like the dedication to it like uh for example uh tyam or kinnon so i i'm not I, I could see my my ranking of this uh change in the future uh you know up or down depending but um yeah obviously obviously i'll i'll, I'll tell you more about the deck uh, in a little bit 
I will also have to talk about it fairly soon. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I think you're you're up with your number eight deck. I, I am I am now. up with my number eight. We're not quite on Darker Thrasios, but I'm oh okay, like, okay okay. I, I, have nice. to, I, have to, I have to keep talking about decks that you guys just talked about. My number eight is Kenrith the Return King. Uh, yep, yep, yep. yep. Uh, Kenrith, like I said, it was the hardest deck for me to place because it can be built in so many different ways, and I would rate the different ways that it's built differently. Um, but again, it's it's a five color deck with like a tad of brewer's advantage because you don't know which version of the deck you're up against. You know that no matter what plan it's on, it's powerful. You know that it has really high overall card quality. Uh, one thing I want to touch on with the Phantasmal Image line specifically, I, Phantasmal Image is better in this deck than Dockside if there's a Dockside on the battlefield because you can kill your own finish. So it combos individually and yep. you don't require a sack outlet. Um, the, the deck is wild, and I love that it is infinite combo dot deck. You have access to all five colors, you have every way to go infinite. Like, the decks that are on the Kenrith as an outlet plan, they're on Bomberman. Like, they're on they're on all, just all the ways to quickly make as much infinite mana, and I really like that it, it was kind of shown in that last, was it was it Chaos's finals, or was it Moxmaster's finals? Um, where Kenrith was going, yeah, I, think yeah. was, I think it was, it was, it was the Chaos, Chaos the Chaos finals yeah. was the one where he was able to demonic consultation away his deck, because all he needed was Dockside and Emil and Kenrith. You know, you don't yep. give a shit yep. about what's left in your library at that point. As long as you have the way to get infinite mana, Kenrith is the outlet, and Kenrith isn't an outlet for you to do something with your deck in the same way that Thrasios is, where you still need yourself to actually accomplish anything. You don't need anything. You just kill your opponents by making them draw cards. And that's it. Yep. Oh, they want to do something? I'll put another infinite draw triggers on the stack for you. No shot. Uh, yeah. I don't think we need to go into too much detail about Kenrith again, but I, the, the deck is good. It's super hard to rate. Good deck. I, I don't think I'd put it higher than eight, but I think that's at the best I could put it where I think it is. I think the deck overall is generically built in what I think is the best way to build it, more powerful than Sisei, and that's why it takes eight and Sisei takes nine for me. So I'll go I'll go into my number eight deck and uh, I guess uh, you know. Gonna start typing shows. it in right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, you know this this may be controversial. A lot of people may disagree with me, but um, uh, my number eight is Florian. Um, and I, you know, I know a lot of people don't you know, see this deck very often other than my hands, but, um, I can tell you that, you know, when I play the deck, you know, I look at any of these decks that are in the top 15, uh, you know, with a couple of exceptions. Um, and I feel like I am at that level at the table with those, with those, with those decks. Um, you know, what Florian has that other decks don't have in terms of turbo is it has the ability to do those in incredibly powerful turbo turns. Uh, win the game out of nowhere in early turns, um, and then if I get blown out for whatever reason or get stopped, you know, unlike you know something like Rogsai or or like uh, you know other other of the the more glass cannony decks, you know, Florian can help me recover and I can put myself back together and go for it again later. It also has a powerful mid range element to it, so I can compete at tables. I can interact um, with other people attempting to win and stop them and get back into the game. Um, you know, in multiple different ways. So I, I do believe in the deck. I believe it's very strong. Um, I, I, I believe in the spot here at that, you know, where it is. So uh, yeah. I know others will disagree, but I, I, I'm confident in the deck. I mean, this is your this is your Kyrick in the top 15. <laughs> one that I think no one else is going to have. But like what I can say about Florian and, and like a real consideration of like putting something like this over deck like Kyrick, I think if you look at the decks and their individual capabilities on just what they can do in a, in a goldfish situation, I think Kyrick is obviously more generically powerful than Florian and just like what the deck can accomplish and how quickly it can do it. But in the way a deck actually plays out, Florian does have a lot going for it where people recognize that Florian is a Rakdos turbo deck, but especially because it's this like lesser known commander that people don't face a lot and people immediately view Florian as a suboptimal version of that strategy in their own brain I think you get a lot of leeway with the way the deck actually plays out in tournaments where people aren't mulliganing as aggressively to deal with you they're not as concerned by what you're about to do as they maybe should be and I think that maybe lets the deck get away with a little more than it should and lets it really shine with its actual power potential and I think that's part of why you've been able to put up such consistent performances on the strategy fair fair and that's that's not to say the deck isn't good. The deck is strong. I think that is part of why it's strong. Yeah, I think that's I will fair. say I will say when I when I sit down uh, across from Max on Florian at the table, I uh, am terrified because that deck just <laughs> kills me every time. So uh, I don't have it uh, in the in the top fifteen, but I will say that it's 
I, I have to go back to it. It's one of these decks that's underexplored. We, we have Max as a champion of the deck and like no one else. So I think that like, it's one of those things if someone, if we had a few more pilots, let's say just like five pilots picked up the list, I think they could, that, that are that are some of the best pilots in the format. I, I could see this uh, just, you know, dominating some tournaments. Um, of course, two color, uh, two color lists right now, they have to be very very good to compete to, with this top uh top 15 list so i think that that's what it struggles with but i do think that like having having this very fast turbo plan with this insane card selection that is florian is very powerful and you can't understate that enough yeah. so my my number eight is a lot higher than you guys put this deck it's it's tevesh Krom. um i actually think this deck is really really good um i i've played a lot with this deck and i i think uh, again a little bit underplayed um sharky has been the main person who has performed on this list but he here's how i see this list i think that this is uh or at least the way i like to build it it is similar to rogsai it's slower uh but it gets this it gets two good commanders um rogsai gets gets commander well Ro rugrak is obviously fantastic <laughs> right it enables so many things but like they don't draw cards right they don't combo they don't draw cards they just Ro rugrak is a little bit synergistic and silas eh, you know it's there sometimes he does things right like it's not like his text is irrelevant but it's not why you're playing the deck tevesh krom like krom uh krom is going to be a uh, a good draw engine, not the best draw engine in the world, but you know, it, it draws cards, it attacks, it blocks really well. And Tevesh is fantastic. You get Displacer Kitten lines. It's a win con. If you have a Hole Breaker Horror, you can, after you make infinite mana, you can bounce Tevesh infinite times. And there's just so much synergy in that list. And it's really just like the way that I like to play Grixis. I think, I, I think rog size is fantastic but i like to go a little bit slower sometimes and have redundancy in the command zone similar to like what we're talking about with florian and so i think this list is is very strong with that um but you know my my opinion on this could change if if more people picked up the list it's just it's just one of those underexplored decks um that i think is is currently underrated yeah, I agree 100 percent with what you said. I had a hard. That's why it's a, ha, such a hard time with that deck because, like, I wanted to put it in here higher. I wanted it to be part of the top 15, and I was like, but but it's just Sharky. It's just Sharky, mm -hmm. um, you know. And and I, I and I wonder, like, Sharky's just so such an incredible pilot. Like, what if what happens if you hand him like, uh, you know, what happens if you hand a Broxide? What happens if you you hand him, uh, you know, a Tivit or or something else? Like, I, he's gonna. I think he's just gonna yeah. blow up. Yeah. Oh everybody. yeah. Sure. Yeah. But that's where it's I will weird. Say, I, I played. The... I played a, a lot of games on this. I played fifty-two games on this list, and it 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 has been. It performs so well. It's it's very good. Yeah, I appreciate a deck that has grind capabilities and isn't all in on being a glass cannon. And I think Krom Tevish takes the win cons of Rogsai. It loses the speed and enabling of Rograk, but you get a real mid-range grind plan and the ability to win at any point of the game, rather than being so locked into the early turns. Your window doesn't just close as quickly. But I do think it's like it's weird to look at a deck and say, "Oh, but it's just Sharky." When like we're including decks like Florian, which is just you, you know, they're busy. Yeah, you're right. Shana. You're you're 100 like, percent like, right. Like I don't you're think that's the right. right mindset to have because these decks have performed you're... and they performed with a talented pilot, and that makes them good decks. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's no, like but I, said, I do I think wanna, it does I... make it hard to analyze. I, I, I no, kinda, definitely. Like definitely. I don't think you should. You have to take that into account a little bit because you know. Uh, like, like with Kinnon, it's tried and true with a lot of people, right? Like, it's, it's sure. just a little bit different in a lot of these other decks, so. Yeah. And I am which... biased towards Florian, which makes it easier <laughs> to put in, in the ranking, so. I might oh, be a too. little you'll see, You'll see my Dark Thrasios ranking soon enough. I, 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 I have a good guess for where you put it. Uh, should we go to my number seven? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I wonder. I wonder what it is. <laughs> and, uh, at number at number seven, I have uh, the partner pairing of a lobster eating pirate and Thrasios. I have Dargo Thras. Sounds uh, like a good deck. Sounds yeah, we're like so a good close. deck. You we're know, so I, close here. You know, I love this deck. You know, I love this deck. What I what I what I really appreciate about Dargo Thrasios in your command zone, you get an infinite mana outlet, you get card advantage, and you get an explosive combo piece. You get to run a true mid-range strategy that also gets to enable a like legitimate turbo game plan, exactly like Max talked about. It's a mid-range deck with fast explosion capabilities. Uh, I love that. You are really, really good. Dargo Thrass is, I think, one of the best decks at looking unthreatening and being able to yep. win out of nowhere because of Dargo because of, like the Dargo lines are wild, where I, I get so annoyed because I know playing against you that you always have to win in your fucking hand. I know it's in your hand and you're just patiently biding your time and waiting 
And and that's part <laughs> of what makes the deck so good. And that's also where like when when people when I've talked about my topic team and people going into this week and I've talked about Dark Rats and they're like, ah, oh, it's just free to waffle in Manila Midget. I'm like, yes, because they play the deck correctly and I think played correctly, this is where it should stand as a top deck in the format. Because I, I play against a ton of Dark Rats pilots lately. There's been a ton of people picking up your list. Almost every time I play against a random Dark Rats player, I ask if it's your list and they say yes. And they play it just wrong. And I'm not trying to be mean by that, but like it's the same way i say oh you always have the win line in your hand and you're patiently waiting they always have the win line in their hand and they go for it early as fuck the yep. first person to go for a win attempt and i do not think that that is at all how this deck wants to be played i think that's just wrong um but i love that this deck has a huge array of possible win lines it is not locked into one strategy you are able to pivot you are able to do different things this is you're gonna love when i say this i think this is the best dock side deck in the format i don't think they're is a deck sorry Corvald, uses... but i agree <laughs> i well okay Corvald uses dockside better than this deck yes but i think in terms of a, a tier strategy that's on this list this is the best dockside deck that uses utilizes dockside in the most synergistic way it's not just making mana like it is for a lot of other decks it is a combo yep. piece it is enabler it is it is everything you need it to be and more um i think that dargo thrass has overall higher card quality than a deck like Kinnon. And while it is still highly synergistic, I think it has slightly less synergy than a deck like Kinnon, which is, I know, a deck that it is compared to a lot when looking at the inclusion of red. Um, I think that where it lacks is kind of onboard static interaction. It really is all on the stack and removal type interaction. You do not have pieces on the board that tell people they have to interact around things. You know, you don't even have something as simple as like an opposition agent or a Dothy. You don't have a Draenith. So or you really don't have, yep. you don't, you don't have any of those pieces that are just like onboard static static interaction it has to be all from hand uh, and mm. because of that mm. this is a deck where i think one of its weaknesses and one of the things you play and do really really well with the politics is that this deck does tend to rely on its opponents dealing with each other a little bit more if you're not able to push out a quick win of that oh, because i think yeah i think you're so on point with that and like i it once makes me want to segue just for like a a, a a small second in the sense that like the importance of knowing a deck's weakness like that you talk about brewer's advantage right so when you when you have a deck that you own and you breathe and you've lived right knowing the deck's weakness and knowing how to play around it and knowing how to how to adapt to compensate for it makes your deck better like gives you an advantage over everybody else um and i think that's that's probably why like when i see dargo thrasios and it's not you or it's not midget it, it because they don't understand those weaknesses as well as you guys do. Um, yeah, I and... blow them out like every time. Like every time they go for winners, I've been able to blow them Me out. Me too. Yeah. Oh, it, it opens yep. beautiful windows for Florian. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely but... get into this more, but I definitely uh, in a moment. But I'll, I agree with what you guys are saying. Absolutely. Um, and and that's one of those things where it's like some of these decks just take a lot of games to to, to really master. And I think that we haven't had a lot of pilots do that quite yet. Yeah, but overall, like it is a stupidly powerful deck. I love Darker Thrasios. It is absolutely a deck I am interested in playing more going forward. It's got its pros and cons, and its pros are really, really good. And its cons are not that deep. There's not too many of them. Yep. yep. Uh, what do you got at seven, Max? I have Bruce Thrasios, um, and you know I, I have it very high. Um, and you know I, I, I agree with everything you guys were saying. Uh, about it earlier and it, its need to adapt to what's happened. But the reason I have it ranked so high is because I think that's coming. I really believe that that's coming because I think that that partner pairing is actually really well suited for what I see as a, a meta that's gonna slow down a little bit. Um, I think we're, we're gonna see the turbo decks sort of fall off a little bit. I think we're gonna see more control being played uh, you know, during the winter, the winter of control. And I think that there's an opportunity there for people to pick this deck back up again, innovate a little bit on it, and and have it come rise back to the forefront. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to be a top five deck, um, but I think you know here at seven is is where I think it has the potential to quickly grow into, um, if that makes sense. And uh, I do think uh, uh, Underworld Breach needs to be in the deck. <laughs> yeah, um, <absolutely>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think they, I think they need Breach. Yeah, yeah, and I, I could see I could see that actually absolutely coming true uh, in the coming months. So I, I'm really curious. I hope I hope our predictions are correct because uh, I, I want to see the return of Bruce Thras. <laughs> Maybe this um, is my next deck. Maybe that's the next deck. I got a champion after I get a win on Kinnan. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll find out. We'll find um, out. Tune in in a month. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> 
Well, uh, my number seven is Atraxa. And this is something where I've gone back and forth on. I think it's de it definitely is a very, very powerful list. It, it was higher and it's gone a little lower. Um, it's it's super good, but I mean, it's one of those things where it's it's definitely not reliant on your commander, but you do have this huge risk factor and pyroblasts and red blasts exist. So I think that's like the that's like the main downside of this deck. Of course, again, we always have to talk about if it doesn't have red, that's an issue. Uh, but but this list is so synergistic and just gets so many good cards. Like uh, like I've been wanting to run Culling Ritual in a list for so long. And this list is so good for that. Uh, Culling Ritual is so fantastic. Um, it gets Displacer Kitten. Is I, I think this is probably, arguably, the best Displacer Kitten deck in the format. Pro I think it is. Uh, because you just win the game once you get a Traxa and Kitten in play, uh, even if it's a lot of mana. And Food Chain is fantastic in this list, too. You don't have to go infinite for it to uh, win you the game. So so such high card high card quality and such a powerful commander your commander is just like uh you get you get to look at 10 cards every time you cast a commander that's insane um and and one other like there, there's a few other random things with this list. like it's a it's a seven seven with vigilance lifelink that i mean those are the relevant things on that card and that that's well i guess okay flying matters too but basically <laughs> combat decks it's so hard to kill you like well, how, well, how do you it, beat it is, a seven it is seven? Death touch too. It is death touch too. Yeah. Okay, that, that does not matter. Not relevant at all. Not relevant. But yeah, I think that's like that's really cool. It's just got all these like random things that are uh, very powerful. I think it's got very powerful layered win cons, which allows the card quality to be very high. I think that's super cool. And I do think there's a lot of ways to build the deck. We've seen uh, Punny Name do a lot with this deck. We've seen Christopher K uh, just just dominate the Swiss um, and do so well with this list. Um, and they've just gone back and forth on on so many of these these card changes um and 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 done well on all of them so i think that maybe this list could just be getting better and better as time goes on it's hard to say um but yeah i mean you know if this list had dockside it might be it might be number one i don't know yeah <laughs> i also i also do want to give a I, I do want to give a quick shout out to nato another really yes. fantastic pilot on the deck um he was the one who won scg con columbus and was in yes. one of my top 16 matches in a, a previous one of the tournaments i don't know which one um but yeah i i have a track set number uh, number six uh where we're getting into next which just kind of kind of goes right into it and you pretty much literally read my note sheet <laughs> like like almost <laughs> almost word for word like i even put word for word such high card quality paired with, like you, you said the exact <laughs> um but no the, what i have written yep, down for yep. me, commander provides explosive card advantage combo potential and an outlet for an infinite mana combo i, I literally wrote gets to play calling ritual at its finest yeah um <laughs> su such, such high card quality paired with really solid synergy far more explosive than it's giving credit for one of yeah. the best tutor decks in the format you to its fullest potential both black and green which i think are the two best tutor colors mm -hmm. has a real beatdown plan with its commander can get absolutely blown to fucking pieces by an rev <laughs> <laughs> hitting key pieces yep. really really takes away its ability to win like if you take away its thoracle and its food chain and like uh or like its bowmaster like if you just get rid of those three pieces this deck can't win you know what I mean? Like it, ha it is immediately on the beatdown plan and it just like doesn't have the combo in existence. Um, and so because of that, I do feel that the deck lacks overall resiliency. It's also really bad at getting back its pieces. Um, they tend to mm -hmm. run like one Eternal Witness or Noxious Revival or Durance Effect, but like they're not a deck that's looping those things infinitely. And I mean, sometimes they do. They, there are some Endurance can, lists that can. can do it. Yeah, the Endurance yeah. list can do that combo. The ones that don't have Endurance cannot properly do that combo. Um, but like the deck, is stupid powerful, stupid high card quality, explodes out of nowhere. But if you are able to blow it out, if they go for the win and they do not succeed, I do find that the deck struggles to recover. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Fair. That's accurate. And guess, guess what I have? That's why six. I don't have it higher. That's why I don't have Let it higher. Let me guess, Atraxa Grand Unifier? Uh, I, in fact, it is Atraxa. It oh, is Atraxa wow. Grand <laughs> I mean, Amazing. we're hitting that, and, we're and, hitting that and, point. <laughs> and I, I agree with everything you just said, and I'm not going to say a whole lot more. I got a couple, couple key points. One is it's another one of those juggernaut decks where, you know, if you, you feel like you stopped it, right? But if they still have their pieces in the deck and they're still creating mana, they're still going to cast a Traxa and they could still just come back from nowhere if they could just get a Traxa on the battlefield. Um, and that you just feel that pressure at all times when you're at the table with it, like you. You know, counting mana. Can they cast the tracks the next turn? Can they cast the tracks the next turn? You know, keeping track of that the whole time. Um, I will say, you know, 
the, the other problem with the deck, one of the weaknesses of the deck, is you do get those games where they go, boom, turn two, Atraxa, pass, lose game. Yes. I was right. just going to bring that up. Yeah, that, that's that's the only other thing that's an issue with this deck is, yeah, you just, if you tap out for Atraxa, people know it's a window because they saw what you drew. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%, but, 100%. But also, because of what you drew, sometimes they feel pressured to shoot their shot. Yeah, yeah they do. They I do. mean, yeah. fair. It, but it, it definitely it can it can uh, roll both ways though. I, I definitely yeah. I think so. The other thing I was going to say about Traxa is it it is another deck that has warped the format and and the way it's warped the format is that everyone is running multiple clone effects in their deck right now and the reason they're doing that is because of Traxa not just Traxa but Traxa being a big one you know being able to copy the Traxa can can just swing a game by itself. Dockside. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's why. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's both. I mean, you know, we always had clones. We always had clones for, for Dockside, but you didn't run like four clones for for just try to hit Dockside. Okay. Um, yeah. You do run it now because there are enough targets for clones now to be worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, and Atrax so, is a big reason for that. Yeah. I think that's a really good segue into another very clonable commander, which is oh, my yeah. number six, and that is Tivit. Um, I have been so I it's, I think some people have been rating Tivit higher than number six, quite a lot higher. Um, I am a little bit lower on Tivit. I, I, it's number six. I still think it's a fantastic deck, but I do think it's a little bit overrated. Um, and 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 the reason being there, uh, I mean, Red Blast, Pyroblast exist. Like that's that's a given. I think that's just something that you have to keep in mind with this deck is that uh, when there's there's every deck that can pretty much runs two spells that just you know stop your commander point blank uh that's that's pretty rough i think i think tivit is is very very powerful with the time sieve line but there are a couple issues and, and number one i just think that like it's so, when you have such an expensive commander that if you don't have the combo is is somewhat slow even when you get it in play obviously it's a fantastic value engine and um it, it can just win you the game with beat down uh a beat down plan um, but but it feeds Dockside when it does that. It comes out and there's another window. Like you're not tapped out, but like you know, oftentimes I see Tivit Tivit come down because people kept a Tivit hand, and all of a sudden someone goes for a win and they're cracking a clue and then they're tapped out. So I, yes, I think yes. I think it can it can it really can perform like we've seen it. Like you know, it's, it, it is is somewhat tried and true to this tried and true at this point. The deck is is good, but I don't know. I just I don't think it's um I don't think it's in my top five. Uh, right now um and I, I really think that just esper is a little bit underpowered at the moment um it just comes down to red being so good like you just don't quite have this explosive potential other than specifically time sieve um that these other uh, top five decks have yeah i mean uh my my number five is pivot if we want to just segue i suppose um, so I figured you'd say. Yep. yeah yep. is your is your number five pivot as well mac my, my number five is Tivit. I imagine you and I are going to be exactly the same. I think, I think we are. Which I think after after Waffle does his number five, which I have a pretty strong guess of what it is. I think then well, we we've talked like, about it. Yeah, yeah. We can we can we can reveal our top four, and then I think we can just talk about the decks individually once we've kind of revealed yeah. our order on them, rather than like repeatedly go over them. Um, but what I really yeah. like about Tivit, everything I said about Malcolm Timna kind of holds true here. But I think this is just a better version of Esper where you get the A plus B combo with the commander. But generically, you are a deck that gets to play Graph Digger's Cage and Cursed Totem. The same way I'm preaching yes, Calling yes. Ritual for Atraxa, I will preach Graph Digger's Cage and Cursed Totem for any deck that can reasonably play them. They are such powerful effects in the format right now. Tibbet is a commander that provides you mana and card advantage and a clock in the command zone. You will kill anyone in just a few attacks if you are in the grind out game and you need to eliminate one person. Tibbet has disgustingly high overall card quality. There are going to be certain decks running certain pieces that are not great without Tibbet. Some of them are just on like, oh, a random Urza High Artificer, which is not the best overall card quality in CDH if it's not utilizing a fuckload of clues. But generically speaking, the card quality is very, very high. And that kind of goes either way, where if you're on those cards like Urza, your deck will have higher overall synergy. If you're just on the Esper good stuff, your deck is going to have lower overall synergy. Because of the way Tivit is and the way it grinds and the way it controls, which one thing I wanted to mention when you talked about Malcolm Timna as a control deck, and you said it was your last control deck, I view Tivit as a control deck. Um, but what I like about Tivit is it is a deck that I feel always has a chance to win the game at any point in the game. I never feel like Tivit is completely out of the game. They are always something you have to keep in the back of your mind. And I think I spectated your game last night where you you forgot about a Tivit deck, right? 
Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, and then yeah, that yeah, Tivadec yeah, yeah. was able to rise from the ashes once the pieces were gone and slam their win con. I don't think oh, there was different. a, I don't, I don't think there was a single deck in the format that hides behind a fist or a fish or a Ristic as well as Tivit. They are so happy to just sit on that thing forever and wait and use their key interaction pieces. And when it's time, they'll slam the big baddie and go from there. They can have key pieces that are really easy to hit like if they're going for their time sieve line and you fuck up their time sieve line i don't feel like tibbet is very resilient in that sense and they're not on a lot of graveyard recursion either so like once a piece is gone a lot of the times it's gone some decks are on savin's reclamation but like some of them are on rest in peace not jokingly so it's not a deck that i feel is very resilient when you do stop the win that it is currently for but it is very resilient in normally being able to win the game in some other way and that goes down a long list of possible win cons where i'm talking once you get rid of their thoracal you get rid of their meme betrayal you get rid of their time sieve i've seen timid decks win the game and like okay now i've assembled displacer kid into fairy and now i'm going to cast a billion spells while um draining you with blind obedience if that's what i have to do like they always have some way to win the game and it's not a deck you can just like forget about yeah yeah i think you i think you nailed it i think you really nailed it and obviously my my fifth is is also tivit and you know one of the things that tivit does um better than any other deck in the top 15 is it it is a stacks control deck right the ability for it to play graph digger's cage curse totem blind obedience even in some cases rest in peace brings this whole other angle to uh to the game um it is frankly the deck i fear the most when i'm playing florian is tivit because it, it's got all the silver bullets that I don't want to see. Um, it's got Dreneth Magistrate. It's got it's got all of the the hate bearers that you know these Turbo Breach decks just cannot win through. Uh, so it brings that to the table right from the get go. Um, and then it, like you said, it does everything that Malcolm Timna does. It draws cars. It creates resources. It does all of those things. But unlike uh, Malcolm Timna, that just has the one angle to try to win the game. It has all these other angles to win the game, with one being a simple one card combo with, like you said, with, with Time Sieve. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it's just, it, it is the strongest Esper deck in the format by a mile, by a country mile. Um, and I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I would think it would even do better than it has, but um, I think it does struggle a little bit with the same problem that Atraxa has, which is you get a lot of these games where they go turn two, slam a Tivit, lose the game. Yep. Right. But but um, compared to Atraxa, Tivit does have the option of holding up two mana. It does immediately give you mana to interact with, which is very important. Yes, although I That's think true. the pattern is, is most of the time, you know, if you're playing an early uh, an early Tivit, that means you prioritized an early Tivit over interaction, right? So, you know, more cases than not, like when I'm playing Florian, for example, and I'm looking for windows, if I see someone prioritize a turn two Tivit, you know, that's, I'm, I'm going to see that as a window and I'm, I'm going to take my shot uh, almost every time, you know, the, you know, the rest of the table, depending, of course. For sure. Um, so I think that is, I think that is a weakness of the deck, but I think it has a lot of ways to, to compensate for that weakness. Uh, I just don't think it's quite as versatile, um, you know, or a, as some of the other decks that are above it. Um, well, yeah, uh, it, versus the other decks above it, but with the like Atraxa and Tivit, one combo I really want to highlight just one more time that I think is really powerful. If you are a deck in blue and white that has a commander that you want to blink and you get to play Displacer Kitten for that reason, being able to then also add to Fairy individually, insane. both pieces are such high card quality and such high synergy and together they're just another win line. It's so nice to be able to slot that package into your deck. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in there real quick. I, <laughs> this is probably an unpopular opinion. And it's and I, I am like a huge fan of Displacer Kid. I love that card. I don't think it's that good for Tibbet personally. I think it's good, but he, here's here's the thing about it is with Tibbet, you, you are, you're gonna wanna be blinking Tibbet obviously. And what you're gonna get is basically two treasures and three clues, right? So the issue is you want to have mana and card draw from a Displacer Kitten line. With Atraxa, all you need to do is find any zero mana artifact and you keep going forever. Like any any zero mana artifact, or even if you just have a little bit of mana, any mana positive artifact in your top 10 cards continues the chain. With Tibbet, you already have to have a lot, like like high resources. With So basically the difference is uh, with Atraxa, you can be on like no resources to start it. And Tibbet, you have to have like multiple spells that are relevant to cast to start. Because what happens is you're casting a spell 
I mean, if you have a bunch of free rocks, it doesn't matter, but like, if it costs a mana, you don't have enough mana made to crack a clue and keep going. And you only have one look at another piece. So I do think that like, Displacer Kitten is is good with Tivit, but I don't think it just wins the game. And I and I do think that like, Teferi That's is fair. one of those cards that like, is insane when it's good and terrible when it's bad. So sure. I, I, I don't love those two cards in the deck personally, and I think that's one of my issues with Tippet right now. Um, even if I love the cards, like, just, you know, in other decks. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I one thing I really want to... Yeah. I do want to yeah. highlight with Displacer Kitten specifically. I, I completely hear you, and I agree with what you're saying and the fact that Tippet does not win the game with Displacer Kitten right away. But I think what's important to recognize is that when Atraxa comes down with Displacer Kitten, they are attempting to win the game that turn. And I don't feel that that is the case with Tibbet. Because what we said about Tibbet, Tibbet is a Stax control deck. Stax control decks are not focused on winning the game in one individual turn. They trust that they can smother you. And what control decks need is an abundance of resource to properly dominate. And having Displacer Kitten paired with Tivit, where then it's, okay, I use a Counterspell, I get two more treasures, three more clues. Okay, I use a piece of Interaction, I get two more treasures, three more clues. It's almost like this final blow of, you're never actually getting out of this grasp. Like, I will dominate you. And then they do have the ability to sometimes combo off with it later. Yep. Yeah, so no, I'll, I'll, I agree I'll, with that. I just, you just have to have cards in hand to start. Definitely. And if you're on low resources, then it feels bad. That's all. No, I yeah, that. so I I, uh, I've had I've had a lot of you know tries to make Displacer Kitten work in other decks, and it's always been challenging to to assemble the Teferi and Kitten combo, you know. And the big reason for that is just so damn mana intensive to put both of those things in place and then have you know that that last uh, spell to to get things you know going the, the zero mana rock or whatever to, to to go off from there. But what what Atraxa and Tivit both have going for it is they're both huge mana decks. They're big mana decks. They're built to generate lots and lots of mana. So the hurdle of being able to cast both of those things at the same time and having those zero mana rocks available, those decks just have them. They have them, they're built for them. Um, so Tivit and Attraxa can abuse that combo more than anyone else. Um, I you know, I hear where you're coming from, you know, where it it can be a bit kludgy at times, you know, um, you know, but it, you know, it, it generates so much value for them that you know you don't have to win with it for it to be worth playing. Um, so I I I do I like Displacer Kitten and Teferi in the deck. Um, I think it I think it can make it work. Um, but I, I do understand the reservations too. Yeah. So absolutely. You know, from there well, I think that's we a just, good segue. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. To a really good Displacer Kitten deck. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, my number five is course Darko Thrasios. Which by the um, way, you're, it doesn't work with your commanders, but <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, don't worry about that. No, I <laughs> agreed. I, I th again I think Atrax is a better one. But um yeah, I think this is, of course, this is my list. I'm biased. Um, I do think that, like, I, I, I do feel pretty strongly that it, it is needs to be around this slot. Um, and, you know, like like I said, like, if we have some more pilots pick up this list and, hey, maybe they don't do very well, I, I would definitely be open to moving this down the totem pole. But currently with my experience, I think Darker Thrasios is, is uh, deservedly in the top five. Um, but, yeah, this is, like you said, just fantastic dockside combo deck it is a mid-range blue pile which is how i like to play the game we get to interact on the stack we get to have those powerful powerful blue cards not just removal uh, or not just interaction but bounce spells um we get to have the card draw spells of ristic mystic um and we get this just overwhelming uh overwhelmingly good card quality um you know dockside just is so strong with the commander um thrasios is like one of the best or if not the best infinite mana outlet in the game uh as far as commanders go and um yeah it definitely has some weaknesses of course like not having black in your deck is a huge weak weakness and not having white is also a pretty big weakness we don't have access to good tutors or good silence effects so we have to play the deck a little bit differently and i think that's one thing that's interesting with this list is we it's it's an adaptive game plan where we are not necessarily trying to assemble the same a plus b combo the only the only card that we get every single game pretty much is dockside and other than that we are just basically building our uh, plan as we go so sometimes like we can't the best card in the deck other than dockside is probably greater good it just wins with a little bit of mana and dargo it's fantastic it's just one mana draw seven um and of course discard three but basically one mana draw seven over and over and over um it's insane 
but we just have to draw it or mulligan for it. So, you know, it's, but we have so many cards like that. We have Life's Legacy, all of our, uh, all of our Neoform effects, our pot effects get us Tide Spout Tyrant, which also just wins the game. Um, and on that note, we just have so many win cons. It's like, you're not really worried if something gets stopped or exiled, again, other than Dockside, uh, because we can just win another way. So very resilient deck. Um, and, and the last thing I really will say is that I think that um, we are, the cool thing about this deck and one one of probably the like one of the reasons i think it is in top five is that it is so flexible we can win turn two i mean you could potentially win turn one but really realistically you can win turn two or you can win turn eight and you're happy about both i think that's really cool it's a, it's a deck that really utilizes windows well and i think every single deck in this uh in my top five can do that um similarly and i think that's that's what sets them apart um and you know i think that you when you have these two separate game plans that have a little bit of overlap with thrasios and dargo combo versus grind you're in a really good spot in any meta and so you you don't really have um necessarily bad matchups because you can play around stacks and you can play uh around turbo really well so i think that's that's why i rate the deck really highly i definitely want to see how this changes my opinion um or how my opinion changes going forward um and currently i'm <laughs> we'll talk about this a little more later but currently i'm testing some new decks for a little bit taking a little break from dargo thrasios and so we'll see if that changes my opinion as well but um yeah definitely obviously a huge fan of this deck so that brings us to our top four now we're not going to go off over the top four in the exact same way because we know that our top four are the same as each other's top four maybe in slightly different orders uh so what we're going to do instead is just list off our personal top fours in whatever order we put them um maybe say some minor things about why we chose a certain deck over another deck when we go through those decks but then we're just going to spend a little bit of time each talking about like the decks but not skipping around to oh i have this one at four i have this one at two so talk about them in breaks we'll just talk about the decks one at a time collectively um so me personally at number four i have rogsai at number three, I have Blue Farm. At number two, I have Kinnon. I'm obviously not biased at all. And at number one, I have Najila. Yep, and my top four are in exactly the same order. Rogsai, Timnacrom, Kinnon, and Najila. Yep. My top four is a little bit different. I have Kinnon at number four, and then I have Rogsai number three, Najila at number two, and Timnacrom at number one. Yeah, and you're yeah. playing Tibnacrom right now, right? So uh, it... yeah, maybe I'll I'll just talk about that real quick to start us off. Yeah, so this is this is the the change I've been making for some tournament decks. I, uh, you know, I I love Dargo Thrasios, but I do think Tibnacrom. Obviously, I think it's the best deck in the format based on my my rating here. Um, yeah, I think that uh, just having access to um, all the most powerful colors, uh, Sands Green, uh, and two commanders that just draw you cards on their own you just you know you don't even need to play anything from your hand some games other than mana and you can win the game so i think that um it's it's just a super solid option right right at this moment but i will say and i think you guys probably all agree that these lists are definitely flexible as far as these these top four ratings i do think I, I do feel strongly about this order but i don't think that like there's a big difference in in the order here i think that these decks are all going to perform super well and due to the um, amount of craziness that can happen in CDH with politics, uh, turn order, and just, you know, it, it's really hard to, uh, to to win a tournament with any deck. I think all of these are going to be really, really, really strong tournament decks and all have a fantastic shot of winning any tournament they enter. So Yeah, yeah I think that's fair. I've played a lot of Blue Farm, um, and the only reason I have it ranked a little bit lower and have it at third uh, is because it, it's actually kind of a similar feeling that I had about Kenrith, which is, you know, the deck gives up a little bit of extreme strength in any one category to be very yep. strong in all categories. Um, and, you know, sometimes that can be a liability at the table. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, you know, Blue Farm's autopilot, you know, you give it to anyone, they just win. And I think that is the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, Tim Nacrom is one of those decks that will absolutely allow you to kill yourself. Like, if you're not a good pilot, and you're not careful and you make misplays, the deck will stab you in the heart. Um, but if you play it well and you're a good pilot and you're on top of things, this deck is a lethal weapon um, and can 
uh, just do things, you know, from anywhere. It could win every, you know, every way you could imagine it could win. It finds its way back from nothing. You know, I've seen people exile like two thirds of their deck and still manage to find a way to win with that deck. <laughs> you know, it just it just gets there somehow magically. It's it's amazing. I've I, it, it's also you know really fun to play. Like playing Tim McCrum that, is fun. That's something I really yeah. I was actually about to say that. It was the last thing I want to say. I think this deck is boring in that it is just a lot of good cards like looking like brewing tim necrom um i mean i've been having fun with it but like you're, you're really just you're only having fun with a couple of flex slots i think the list is is you know there's a lot of really solid tim necrom lists and there's a lot of choices that aren't necessarily that impactful but i think playing the list on the other hand is actually fantastic it fits my play style really well you have these really adaptable flexible game plans you have to make some hard decisions and i, I think it's fantastically fun to pilot um uh, even if it's not the most interesting looking list. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I, my notes on Tim DeGrom are very, very short. Pretty much a reflection of what everyone has said. I, I believe it has the highest overall card quality of any deck in CDH by like a pretty, pretty solid margin almost. It is literally just a pile of good cards. But with that, it lacks synergy. It does not have a lot of synergy in the deck. Nothing is really specifically there to work with any other piece. You know, Tim the deck, Tim Necrama used to play like Loyal Apprentice, which you would say was a synergy piece. It's not on those effects anymore. The closest you get now is like, if you're on Dothy, it can't be blocked. You know what I mean? Like it's not- it's Or not Saras there. in it, right? Or yeah. Saras in it. Like, like the deck is not really a synergy deck at all. It is a pile of, very high card quality CDH cards, and that is the name of the game with the deck. It has excellent card advantage in the command zone, being combined Timna and Krom, where, again, maybe like the best synergy in the deck is that Krom is a great attacker for Timna. It has powerful win conditions. You're on Breach, you're on Thoracle, you're on Dockside Lines, you're on uh, Monomic Betrayal, Mean Betrayal, Munonic, I don't know how to pronounce that word. You're on Mean Betrayal. Betrayal. Mnemonic Betrayal. But like, it's, power <laughs> it's powerful win cons powerful cards none of it's specifically there to work with each other except for like oh my intuition for my breach pile but like the, <laughs> the deck is just really good yep. um and with that it's it's exactly like like max said like if you were to look at t and k on like the mario kart stacks thing when you're picking your vehicle it is just mario it's just like oh i'm a six or seven out of ten at everything <laughs> like, like it's yep. just yeah very, there, very there is a reason exactly. there's a reason i've named my deck good soup because yep. it's just good cards it is good in a soup, soup. But it, with that, yeah. it is it is far less explosive than the other decks we're about to talk about in top four. Like Rock's Eye Cannon and Najila are all far more explosive decks than what they can do. Obviously, T and K can once it's set up to do that thing, and obviously it has Dockside. It can, but generically speaking, on average, it is just less explosive. It's just more consistent in what it's doing. Yeah, and I think the most explosive is is what we both had at four, uh, which is you know the Rock I think yeah. that that's the most explosive deck in the format. Um, you know. It's just it's just so fast it, that that deck can just win out of nowhere like like it looks like they have nothing on turn two and then all, they just keep going it just keeps going they keep doing things they wheel they keep going they keep going and then the next thing you know the game's over and it, like was that one turn that was only one turn it's not like <laughs> yeah. four turns it's yeah. not like well, five they, turns it was just one though well they did um, cast a in, final fortune so yeah. yeah, right, exactly. The, the only reason I have Rock's High at four and not higher is because there is this phenomenon, uh, which is a beautiful thing for anyone not playing Rock's High, and that is if, if Rock's High is at the table, everyone's looking at Rock's High. Um, and, you know, all attacks are going at Rock's High. You know, interaction is being held for Rock's High. You know, people want to put damage on them whenever they can because they're afraid of the Adnaz. You know, and, and it just, it, it is very targeted and everyone is very aware. It's like the, the opposite of the ignorance problem. Everyone knows what Rock Size is trying to do and, and almost everyone is, is playing it appropriately to try to stop it. Yeah. Um, and it says something of, of how powerful it is that even in spite of that, it just continues to put up results. Yep. You know, you put it in the hands of someone like Zane, you know, yeah, I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing. Stop me. Yep. You know. And that's, that's yeah. the thing about Rogsai, where you said it is hands down the most explosive deck in the format. I would word it as it is the most explosive deck with the, in the format with the capability to consistently turn that explosion into a win. Because yeah, I think I think I think I would say like Kirik and Ikridargo are both more explosive in my opinion most of the time, but they are not able to actually win the game with that explosion as well as Rogsai because it has blue to protect itself. It has Rograk as the commander that enables so much bullshit. It, the deck is wild. So what all I put down for it, pretty, pretty short, it is stupid consistent. 
it is high, high synergy. It can always win out of nowhere because you're going to have some games where you're like, oh, they got up to a slow start. They just did land pass. Maybe they'll have a Pyrocuter. No, they're going to play a land. They're going to calling a week and they're going to add on. It's like they can win out of nowhere. Um, they lack the true protection of white. The closest they get is like defense grid, which is super good sometimes. But at the same time, it has the protection and interaction of blue paired with the speed and gas of Rakdos, which is just so powerful. Um, the one really sad thing about it is it does fold to just like a fuckload of stacks effects where sure like even through most stacks effects you're able to like oh i can thoracle if there's a graph digger's cage or a draineth or whatever um it is not common that they're going for the thoracle from hand that's really not their main line uh and the other thing is they, they fold to like rule of law effects more so than i think any other deck in this in this situation because they just really need to be pushing multiple spells a turn to be able to do anything versus like najila can win just with this commander Kinnon can obviously win through rule of laws and tnk is like happy to just draw cards and interact and like keep a Progressing a little bit at a time. Yeah, I will say I, yeah, I definitely so, agree with you 100. I will say one more thing though. I think Rogsai is a little bit more resilient than people necessarily give it credit. I think a lot of times people count it out if it hasn't won like turn two or three. But I do think that like it can come back, and especially like I, I I'm really glad that a lot of lists are. I know I guess they've they've been on an off psych rift. I'm glad they have board wipes with uh, Mount Doom right or or psych rift. I think that like having that resiliency is important. But I, I do think that like you never really want to count a Rogsai out because I think it can win. Um, win a lot later than some people expect. Uh, obviously, the downside is uh, also that the commanders don't draw you cards, as we, I think we mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, and so they really are, it, it, it's true storm. Obviously, Bryant Cook is the person who championed this deck. His team uh, worked extensively on this deck to get it to where it is today. You know, not just them, but they, they're, they're the real ones who started it. Um, and they are, uh, obviously, the Epic Storm is a... Uh, a deck that has been around forever and that's that's what they go by so um you know they're storm experts and this is a storm deck which has its weaknesses uh it's not as flexible like like you guys are saying um in, in as far as uh you know playing around other things but um i will say uh and this is not a hot take i do think rogsai is the best mystic remora deck in the format i am way more scared of mystic remora on rogsai than any other deck obviously that card is cracked but like I'm literally shaking if I see a Mystical Mora from turn one on Rogsai. I'm like, do not feed that fish. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> yes. I actually, well, I, 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 gonna... I agree with you. I agree with you because like, well, we'll say I did, I did not say that it's not resilient anyway. I didn't, I didn't mention that. I do think it is more resilient than people say. But when I've been in games with Rogsai, which I think if I go through my tracker and even like mentality before my tracker, Rogsai is the deck that I have faced the most of any deck in CDH. The guy I've been playing with since I got into CDH is a Rogsai main pilot. I have faced that deck the most of any deck. And I tell people, and it was like, frustrating when they have a Rhystic and I have a Rhystic and someone says, well, how many cards do you have in hand? And I have five and they have four and they say, okay, Rogs, I can draw. I'm like, I really heart, like in my heart, believe that is incorrect. Like I genuinely well, think putting me at six cards is better than putting them at five. Well, I agree. And here, here's my theory. Here's my theory. So there's two decks in the top four that don't have card advantage in the, in, in the command zone. The other one being Najila. Um, and, you know, you would look at that and see it as a problem. But the reason it's not a problem is because Every stinking card in Rogsai is a card <laughs> yep. to be terrified of. Every single one. So, you know, they don't, you know, they top deck, their top deck is worth three of your Rhystic Study draws, <laughs> right? And and they play those Mystic Remorse. They play those Rhystic Studies. They start drawing cards. It's over because their cards are going to win the game. Um, so, th you know, it that's, that's why it, the card quality is insane from the perspective of winning the game. Um, and, and that's, that's why, like you said, if, if you know, I'm sitting at a table and there's two Rhystic studies, I am paying for the wrong size Rhystic study. Mm -hmm. I, and, and frankly, I may want my, my opponent other than wrong side to draw cards because God, I need some help. Yeah. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you had Kinnon at four. So, you know, what's your, what's your thoughts on Kinnon Waffle? <laughs> so yeah, this is something that we've talked about. I do think that Kinnon is a really good deck. It, I I don't think that it is, and and I, I've told Satellite this as well. I do think that Tim Necrom, Najila, and Rogsai are S tier, and everything else below it uh, is just not quite as good. Um, I think Kinnon is so close still, but I do think that Kinnon is is just slightly worse, um, and only because uh, just a few things is that it's. It, it lacks colors. Um, yes, it's like super synergistic commander, but like, you know, you can, uh, it, it does like foil if you can kill Kinnon um, a, a bunch. I know you can just recast it. Like 
there are exceptions to all the things I'm saying, but like I do think that these these other just like uh, four or five color piles. I mean, rug size and three color pile, but like you know these these basically adaptive combo decks that have um, you know breach dock side just all the good cards shoved in them. Right now, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think that those those homogenous decks can can really just uh, crush the format. Um, and but I, I don't know. I, I I think that like this is still like splitting hairs. I do think Kitten is is barely beneath yeah. them um but yeah that's how i feel yeah and i'll give i'll give I, i'm gonna i'm not gonna let max talk yet because i want to i want to give my argument for why i think kinnon is number two um and and you know it's something that we've talked about a lot and and i think it really comes down to the fact that you know kinnon presents these non-deterministic win lines these non-deterministic game plans that really makes it very difficult for the table to to predict what's going to happen and deal with it. So you get these consistent games where Kinnon just sets up shop, plays a bit of control, and out of nowhere, all of a sudden, it's too late to stop it. Um, and I think that it, it, it does that so consistently and so repeatedly that it, it is a... I think it is warranted to be in that second spot because I don't think any other deck is as hard to see coming and can win as explosively at the same time as Kinnon. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's that's fair. I think it's a good deck. I, I still, even with all that, I, I just feel like um, the other three are just slightly on another level. But uh, again, splitting hairs, Kinnon's a fantastic deck. I don't think like anyone will really argue against that at this point, unless they're playing tie -in. Uh But yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I don't know. Max, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Is it my, is it my turn? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna gush about Kinnon for too long. Obviously, you can say I'm biased all I want. I, I have championed this deck since I began my CDH career. I think it is insanely powerful. Uh, the th the reasons I actually think Kinnon was one of the top decks in the format. And one thing I do want to bring up because I looked at this the other day. Kinnon has been known for a long time as a deck with a really low conversion weight rate, right? That's that's like one of the things that's known for. Uh, if you, uh, if you, I don't know. well, well, when I first got into Kinnon, its conversion rate on EDA top sixteen was under twelve percent, uh, which obviously a lot of these performances are my own. But if you look at CDH since I got into the format, so I use the tournament date of May first as the first one because my first tournament was Mox Masters and like May 9th or whatever it was. Uh, and the top four decks are exactly our top, or not exactly our top four. It, it you know, rock size slightly lower, but you get Krom, Tibbet, and Ajila, and Kinnon, one, two, three, and four. Kinnon has the highest conversion rate of any of those four decks, um, which I think is just something to point out in how well it has been performing in the meta, that it has a conversion rate like that. And that is not just me. That is Pingmeister, that is Stony Tony taking down the cookout, that is random pilots, like, you know, not random in terms of who they are, but like people like Jorman just like deciding to play Kinnon and being able to top 16 on the deck. The deck is very, very powerful from a tournament success standpoint that is not just my results. I think that is just one thing I wanted to mention. Um, the deck is, when you're looking at overall card quality versus synergy, obviously Kinnon is a little bit lower than these other top decks on average card quality, but it fucking demolishes T and K and Najila on synergy. The synergy of Kinnon is off the absolute charts. One of the things I love about the commander, I've been categorizing, if you listen to what I say, oh, this commander is card advantage. This commander is mana advantage. This commander is a combo piece. This commander is an infinite mana outlet. Those are like the four primary categories of what a commander could be. A lot of great commanders are only one of those things. Timna is just card advantage. You know, Jessica is an infinite mana outlet type thing. Atraxa, you get to be combo potential card advantage. You know, an infinite mana outlet. Kinnon is all four. Kinnon is mana advantage. It is card advantage. It is a combo piece and it is an outlet on a two mana commander that you're able to recast a bunch of times. And the deck does not require it all to win the game. It is not like Sisse where we need our commander to win. I have won countless games where there has been a turn one or turn two drain it, and I have never cast Kinnon till the turn I win the game on turn seven. You don't need him. He just makes your deck better. As well as if you look at a deck like Tibbet, uh, of these of these top four decks, Najila is the only one that has A plus B combos, except for Kinnon. Kinnon has A plus B with Basalt, and it does need a little bit of a C, but it will inherently find you that C by itself if it sticks around, where you can just spin into Thrasios and you'll get a ton of Kinnon activations if you have Basalt. Kinnon is able to influence the game 
in ways these other decks just can't. Obviously, they do in their own individual ways. We're like, oh, you have to mulligan differently for Rogzai. You have to be aware of this variety of kills out of Najila. But Kinnon can influence the game with effects like Void Winnower and Wandering Archaic and Perplexing Chimera. These things that just no other CDH deck can consistently play like Kinnon. And they have these wild effects on the game that make it so hard for your opponents to deal with. And because they are these unusual effects, it is so easy for people, even talented pilots, to misplay around them a lot. Kinnon is also not affected yeah. by stacks in the same way. A lot of these other ones are when you're looking at like all, all of these other top decks are utilizing turbo win cons most of the time. Najila gets a little bit different from that. But Kinnon is not affected by any individual piece of stacks. Any individual piece of stacks affects Kinnon in some way. Pretty much all of them hit us in one specific area. Like, oh, there's a Graphic Cage, there's a Curse Totem, there's a Containment Priest, there's a there's a Collector, whatever. But if there's just one of those effects on the board, we honestly don't give a shit. We are able to play around it so so easily and we are also by far the best deck in this format to play through like rule of law type effects which you have to deal with a lot in tournaments where you guys have this very slow progression and we are able to still explode through rule of law by kin and activations so the, the deck is just like it, it hits on all four fronts of what you, you want a commander to be the deck is wildly synergistic it is i believe the most explosive outside of rogsai of these top decks, but it explodes in a way where even if you don't win the game, you are often setting up yourself where your opponents cannot win the game, which means you probably get another turn. And I think that's really important. When Rogsai gets shut down, all the interaction has been used and now people have this window to go for the win attempt. When Kinnon gets shut down, it's okay, we stopped his combo, but he has a Wandering Archaic, a Glenelender, and a Chimera on board. It's it's a very okay. <laughs> different type of situation. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so breathe max breathe breathe take a breath breathe we love tropical simic domination go it's the only time in my life i want to say go off king go yeah. off king <laughs> I, uh... he's like he's like I, i'm yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna gush on kidding gosh love it love it i love kidding it was beautiful it was beautiful, it was beautiful. It was i'm beautiful. genuinely beautiful. passionate about this deck yeah I, I and i i and and you've sold me on it i mean that's why it's it's two i i agree with you i think it's a great deck but like let's let's uh segue you know to the last deck which is i think we all agree is the top deck in the format and that's Najila. and i'll no, i'll waffle, tell you why. i don't waffle, i don't agree waffle, waffle oh, other than waffle, waffle. Oh, that's or right, was right, it yeah. was it two or three for you waffle he had Najila's is number two yeah number two so you have it you have it at two we have it one yeah, the reason yep, I have exactly. Najila at number one is because you know, Najila, like the same principle as Rock'sai, which is you know the, every single card in the deck is such high card quality that it doesn't need the same level of draw engine in the command zone as some of these other decks. It just it it just doesn't need it because every top deck is great, um, you know, and it has these you know so many one card win combinations built into what what Najila can do that no other deck can do. Um, just it gives it the ability to be so explosive out of nowhere, but it also has access to every card you could ever want to play a mid-range game plan. The other thing Najila could do, which I, you know, I fell in love with Najila, you know, months and months and months ago. I don't remember what like chaos it was or whatever, but it was. Um, she, she goes by Alyssa now from Sad Nas, uh, where they had nothing. They had nothing. They had no cards like they had lands and they had Najila, and that's all they needed. Because they just kept swinging with Najila, the whole game had stalled out, and it didn't matter because Najila wins the game completely by herself. She needs absolutely nothing else. But at the same time, she has everything else. Yep. It's incredible. You know, and yep. that, that, to me, is why Najila is head and shoulders uh, above every other deck. Uh, in this list. I'll just, I'll read my quick 10 bullet points, which are just a, a reiteration of what you said. It's a one card win con in the command zone. It has A plus B combos, not A combo, combos with the commander. It gets Thoracal and Breach. It can also win on several different access where you don't know if it's going Thoracal, Breach, or Creature Combo. It can always win in some way. It has disgustingly high card quality paired with really solid synergy. So it's not like Blue Farm where it's just a pile of good cards that is trying to draw them. It has synergy to work with those cards together. Um, I love that it is a Culling Ritual deck, which I think is one of the best, most broken cards in the entire format. And its main weakness is really just that it has no card advantage in the command zone. Agreed. Yeah. I, I, I love Najila. I think Najila is fantastic. I recently had Najila at number one for me. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, I, I just think Timbercrom is slightly better, but it, again, eh, they're all so good at this point. Those, those top, top three or four decks. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, 
yeah i've seen najila so many times just be pressuring life totals over and over and just holding back the the underworld breach combo so uh, attacking on two axes i know it's what you guys said but yeah just attacking on two axes or more is so good uh i love it but um yeah you could definitely run a najila out of cards at some point and um uh, but it's a deck that always needs to be respected and it's one thing it can play like rock side it can play really fast, quick ad nauses, but you can't mulligan against it like Rogsai. Like Rogsai, you you know it's gonna he's gonna try to go quick at, at least somewhat quick. Uh, and but Najila might not go that fast. They're, they might be they might be a, a turn two uh, ad nause, or they might just be Najila turn one and just slowly swing and not cast any more cards and just hold the cards in hand uh, until everyone is out of resources and then win with breach. So I think that's that's really cool the flexibility. Uh, and yeah, I definitely agree with all these other points. It's it's a fantastic deck. I mean, what's what's great about it is you don't even have to speak its language because speed needs no translation. <laughs> Very nice. Very Memo nice. the goat. <laughs> Memo the goat. <laughs> so love you, Memo. We love you. We love you. So I, th I think with that, I mean, I think we, we did it. We, we got through our top 15. Uh, it was a bit of a longer session this time, but I think it was worth it. Um, yeah. Waffle, episode. thank you so much for taking the time to to hang out with us tonight um you know it's always a pleasure talking to you max you want to take us out yeah thank you again for showing up for our wonderful episode of colors or crutch my name is max sternberg aka wounded satellite yeah, i'm max p the italian man and i'm freedom waffle the guest the guest the goat <laughs> dude the, the dargo goat the dargo goat <laughs> <laughs> no, but honestly, thank, thank yeah. you so much for coming on. This was such a blast to record today. I was really excited for this one. And just so you guys know, we, we did not reveal our list to each other. This was, we didn't know what the other person was going to say while we did this. Yep. We just, yeah. we, we knew oh, our we, top We kind of knew our top, yeah. yeah, we kind of knew our top fours just because of like normal discussion, but everything else was totally blind, which I think is really cool how close we came. So yeah, definitely, definitely appreciate you yeah. guys having me. And uh, I think this was really insightful. Yeah. So if you guys like this, Please give us a like, give us a subscribe, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.